Good morning and welcome to our meeting of the Health Committee here this morning. I now declare the meeting open to the public online and I'd like to welcome all our members here this morning to Fatsha Robalig or Majin Gallant Shaw. You're all very welcome this morning participating by video conferencing. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So we have received no apologies this morning, members. Have members, are there any apologies in from members? No, nothing indicated there. Um, chairperson's business then, I, members this week attended, uh, I chaired actually a session that Mary Curie at Queen's University Belfast had organized. It was a research launch event. Um, it was focused on how we support people to live and die well in the North here by 2040. Research was extremely interesting, I have to say, and would, I'd recommend all members to have a look at that. I mean, you would have that probably on your uh, email, but you'd certainly get it with Marie Curie. Uh, very interesting, outlined that there will be a 30% increase in local demand for palliative care in, in, in the North. So that's something that obviously needs to be considered and planned for, and not only how we do more of it, but how we do it better. Um, I think is key. It, it, the meeting was very useful in that there was a very, very expert round table of people involved in the meeting and it looked at various um, sectors in terms of how do we look at, how do we look after people and care for them in life better in hospital, in home, um, in, in other settings. So it was, it was very, very focused and I thought it was very useful uh, engagement. I also want to welcome the neurology statement by the minister. Back to suppose probably everyone's concerns around it for the cohort, um, in terms of that neurology uh, issue that we're, that we're all have been so involved in and aware of for a long, a long time now. And um, so I'll move on then to the draft minutes. So I refer members to item three, uh, which is draft minutes of our meeting of the fifteenth of April, which is a tab three point one. Are members content with the minutes? Yeah, thank you, members. And there are no matters arising from those minutes today. So that will allow us to move then on to our first substantive briefing, which is from the Minister of Health, and he is accompanied today by the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, both are here today to update the committee on the pandemic and other issues. I refer members to tab five of the pack, um, and uh, I'd now like to welcome by video link, Mr. Robin Swan. Um, you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, we're hearing you there, uh, Minister. Can you hear us? I, I, yeah, I just lost you there at the last minute. Of that air call, no problem. Okay. Okay. No, no, good morning, and as ever, thanks for the opportunity to update the committee. Sorry, sorry Robin. Sorry, Robin. I, I just I just want to bring Michael in. I'll bring Michael in first. I'm sorry you, you probably lost us there. We second, but we're also joined this morning, members, by Dr. Michael McBride, who's the chief medical officer. Good morning, Michael. Are you able to hear us? Okay. Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning. So you're both very welcome, gentlemen, and um, I'll go back to you then, Minister, if you would pick up there uh, in relation to your briefing for us this morning. No, look, Chair, and as ever, I'll, I'll keep my, my open remarks short to allow more time for, for questions and engagement. Um, I, I think since the last time I attended the Health Committee on the, the 4th of March, uh, progress has been made in a number of areas, uh, not least the vaccine rollout, which continues at pace, uh, and the numbers of those infected have continued to fall, which has allowed the executive to be, begin the relaxation of restrictions. Um, and the executive was only able to agree those relaxations uh, of restrictions last week because of the efforts that have been made by the people of Northern Ireland to drive down the rate of infection. In addition, the remarkable progress of the vaccine program has significantly reduced the scope of for the virus to spread, as well as the impact on our hospitals. Recently, there has been some volatility, especially over the Easter period. Uh, with case numbers falling rapidly and, and then rising, uh, as was reflected in the R number, which fell to between 0.4 and 0.6 over the Easter holidays before rising again to 0.95 uh, and 1.4 last week. Uh, I'll be briefing the executive shortly this morning. However, I can advise that the COVID-19 modeling group met again earlier this week and has agreed that the R number has fallen back slightly. Uh, and this is obviously welcome news 
and as always, we will continue to keep it under close observation. Uh, we're still roughly at the same position as we were in September uh, last year in respect of case numbers and hospital occupancy. But the crucial difference now is that the vaccine program means that the proportion of the population that is susceptible to virus transmission is much smaller with those who are infected less likely to be hospitalized. However, there is an ongoing increased risk of transmiss transmissibility due to the variants which have emerged since December, uh, whilst the relaxation of measures will hopefully now be permanent. Although there is a high level of uncertainty regarding the short to medium trajectory of this virus, in line with spy M projections for England, it is expected that as more and more of society opens up, uh, case numbers in Northern Ireland will rise, even as the vaccination programme continues to be rolled out. The extent to which hospital admissions will rise will depend on the magnitude of the increase in cases. However, we expect that any increase in hospital admissions will be proportionally less than during previous periods, as cases will affect many the younger, younger age groups who are less likely to become um, more severely ill. However, as members will know, our vac vaccines and the vaccination does not provide 100% protect protection and every life loss will be a tragedy. In addition, those with mild initial symptoms can still experience serious long-term effects of COVID infection. Therefore, it's critical that we, we use our, our renewed freedoms responsibly by continuing to practice social distancing and apply good hygiene. It's also essential that the younger age groups come forward and match the high rates of vaccine take up uh, by their parents and grandparents. My department will continue to monitor the trajectory of the virus to see if cases are rising faster than expected uh, with robust contact tracing in place to identify and control any outbreaks quickly. There also remain threats such as new variants which are less responsive to vaccines as well as the potential for the effectiveness of vaccination to wane over time. Therefore, we need to remain on alert as we move forward. And finally, as you're aware, I, I made an oral statement to the Assembly um, on the 13th of April on my immediate plans for rebuilding our health and social care services and on the publication of the trust rebuild plans for the months of April through to June. I also provided an update on some of my longer term rebuilding initiatives uh, focusing on our cancer services, our waiting lists and on the significant constraints I face in tackling these. Um, I, I believe I have two officials uh, who are coming to provide you with further detailed briefing on the rebuilding of services uh, immediately after my presentation today. So, Chair, I don't want to steal um, any of their thunder. Um, so I'm now happy to take comments and, and questions from, from members. Okay, thank you, Minister, for that. And I have to say, uh, I do reiterate and, and support your your uh, your your comments around the vaccine program, and including today this morning's update. Uh, that's been released by the department and, and the very welcome news that I think it's 90, almost 90 percent of 50 year olds have now over 50s have now received the vaccine. So that continues to be a, a tremendous positive in terms of hope and, and looking to the future. So that is to be welcomed and, and every one of your team in relation to that deserves full credit for it, I have to say. Uh, Patricia Donnelly and all the staff right down through and all the staff on the ground. So well done on that. Um, a couple of quick ones, just if we can, Minister, before I go into some of the more, just sort of picking up on a couple of issues. I had asked uh, at, the pre at the, your previous appearance here uh, for minutes of meetings of the Critical Care Hub, the Respiratory Hub meetings and the Oxygen Supply meetings. Can you update us when we could expect to get that response? Um, I, I said I would consider releasing those sets of minutes, Chair. I haven't had time to read through the full sets of minutes just to see what's what they're contained, what they're about, but we are we are considering that that, that request. I have no fixed date to get them to you at this moment. Okay, um, okay, okay. Well, we'll 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 keep we'll keep an eye on that one. Um, in terms of then, the, the, there has been, I suppose, recent distressing uh, reports around the issue of um, health inequalities across a number of across a number of, of spectrum, and I, I think maybe. Paula may pick up later in terms of her role as chair of the all-party group on cancer. 
but we're seeing confer- concerns from or in terms of oral health inequalities, in terms of cancer, in terms of, you know, I, I recently spoke with uh, the College of Podiatrists who are, who are expressing concerns because they haven't been seeing and picking up on things. So inequalities already was a blight before, I suppose, COVID came along at all. They've now been additionally impacted by COVID, which, which has an unequal impact in itself, by the reduction of services, which have exacerbated the situation, and also by the uh, by the, the the later diagnosis, which is impacting on people individually, health wise, and will also impact significantly on the health service in terms of treatment options and uh, length and expense of treatment, and all of that will will factor in. One of the issues that arose was where by many people now, and it varies widely across the north, are being forced into going to private assessments for autism. Um, now that's widely varying across health uh, health trusts. But it's also it's also impacting obviously measure, things like that impact more heavily on the less well off and people who are already disadvantaged. But can you tell us how many private referrals for autism have been received now across the five trusts? Oh. Uh, Chair, I, I don't have that sort of number um, in, in front of me. Uh, you know, if, if there are those specific, I think I said in the previous presentations, if, you, if you're looking the exact figures, it'd be, it'd be useful if I could get a heads up. And then I can have that preparation um, done for you. But in regards to, uh, I suppose, the inequalities, we did publish that uh, in the measure report that came out recently. Uh, My Transformation Advisory Board received an update uh, yesterday from Public Health uh, in regards to those health inequalities across Northern Ireland. Uh, It may be useful, Chair, for the committee uh, if they received that same presentation. Um, Because I think one of the things that was very clear coming out of that is that to address health inequalities, we have to do it as an executive. We have to do it as a, as, as a collective, as, uh, as an assembly, as a people of Northern Ireland, for there's no point, and I think the point that come across very clear, if you're in a housing condition, in an employment condition, um, that hasn't aided your health recovery, there's um, the, the challenge is if you bring somebody out of a challenging setting, bring them into the health service, make them well, it's nearly a step back returning them to the same conditions. We should be returning them to a better condition. We should be giving them a better quality of life through through their supports and social supports that they need. So that comes down to housing, employment opportunity, educational inequalities. It was a very good presentation, Chair, in regards to where we are in health inequalities across Northern Ireland, but the steps that need to be taken uh, to actually tackle them. In regards to, to your specific, in, in regards to autism, I think you will be aware, as I say, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but you will be aware I uh, recently um, published uh, the Interim Aut- Autism Strategy Update and the actions um, that are within that strategy is actually to implement a new framework of care uh, to deliver a proactive, integrated and streamlined pathway for, for children and young people across the region. I think one of the things, Chair, that I've, I've always said, and especially as we come out of, as we come out come out of our waves and, and the restrictions we've had on our health services, is to look at that regional approach, so that we break down the postcode access that we've had to to health services uh, in the past, and that's uh, in that um, in in that framework is actually will we'll provide a range of early intervention approaches as well to support and meet the needs of, of families and carers. The, the, the assessment of children um, in, in schools and, and getting their, their, those assessments uh, were challenging before COVID, and with with the challenges to education and you know when schools not been open as well, those, those challenges have been not exacerbated. But I, I don't have those specific numbers there, but I will get them to you. Okay, and, and would would you accept, Minister, that it is unacceptable that that increasing numbers are having to go private and that there's a two tier system, and um, that a two tier system would be unfair. Colm, uh, it's not something that I have to disagree with. You have said it many times since coming into this post. My ideal national health service is that of Nive Evans, free at the point of, point of use, free at the point of need. That's where I want our health service to get back to, and that's why I think that the collective work that we have been doing in the Assembly and the indicated support that I've got across the executive is what we have to do, and that's to rebuild our health service back to where it is, making those demands where we aren't seeing the postcode approach that we've seen in the past and the silos that were there. And I've said this, they weren't silos that were built up intentionally. 
um, but there's silos that we can break down intentionally as well. And that's why that regional approach to, to the rebuild of our summer service of our services is key to this. Okay, okay thanks, Minister. And um, just the last brief one before I go into my final question is I have raised and committee members of I've all raised um the need for um, us to get back to a more regular way of bringing forward amendments on the SL1 into the SR. We recognise the department and others. Everyone has been working under tremendous pressure and in very unusual circumstances. But can you give us any indication when the department will be able to move back to a more normal procedure in terms of bringing forward um, changes to regulations in terms of the SL1 process then the SR? Uh, now, Chair, is, is that specifically in regards to COVID or in general in regards to... Um, well, well in, especially in regard to COVID, we, we are seeing some of the SL ones, but COVID obviously regs are coming in. You know, so can, can we look at more forward planning in relation to the SL1 process with COVID? Uh, we, we have, Chair, and I think I've written to you uh, um, in regards to that. I think one of the approaches the executive has taken especially come out of this set of regulations is the establishment of the Executive COVID's Task Force, where ministers from other departments actually put uh, requests into it for consideration in regards to relaxations. Uh, they're assessed by a team um, of department, cross-departmental uh, civil servants chaired by the temporary head of the civil service in regards as to how they fit across the Executive uh, COVID or, or the Executive Pathway um, out of lockdown. Uh, those are then bundled or packaged. They come to ourselves here for them for an input from the CMO and CSA before they get back again to be discussed at the executive. So that's why I wrote to you try to, to see how we get a better fit onto that entire process. You know, the executive's pathway um, out of restrictions is now very clear. You know, there are times in it. So I think there's a cross a piece, of, piece of cross work can be done between um, ourselves, yourselves, and maybe even the executive committee and the executive COVID task force as to how that can better be better dovetailed. Yeah, and I think again we would we would welcome progress because obviously that has been that has been quite difficult to uh, to play that scrutiny and to add that value indeed that that the committee process can can add. Um, okay, so I will then. Reflecting on, on your briefing this morning, there, Minister, in relation to COVID, and we are seeing, I think, a very worrying situation in, in India at the present time. I'm struck there by you, you mentioned that there was a rapid fall and then rising here. And actually, some of some of the material I was reading last night indicated that if, uh, India had also seen a very rapid fall and then a very rapid rise. But in light of that Indian variant, which appears to be causing particular concern at the minute. Do we have any uh, cases of that here in the north at present? We don't, Chair. Um, okay. We have no indication. And look, when, when I, I spoke about that rapid fall and rapid rise, that was due to the over the Easter break as well, where we actually saw a decrease uh, in number of tests as, as well, uh, falling into that and then increasing again as well. So we were back um, just even just after the Easter holidays, we were back to doing over 10,000 tests per day. As well, but what we were seeing and what gives us the reassurance uh, that we are still, um, I, I suppose, going on in, in the right trajectory, is that the number or the percentage positive number of those tests being uh, indicated uh, is still staying pretty constant. So even though we are doing more tests, uh, the test positivity rate is staying staying constant as well. So we, we have no indication of any of the, the Indian variants here in Northern Ireland at present, uh, and I, I think there has been three indicated in the south. Uh, from what I've seen through through media. Okay, and in relation to the the uh, the travel regulations that are in place, are you confident that those are robust enough to um, manage that situation, Indian and other variants? Indeed, that that we have a system in place that will cope at this point in time and moving forward, especially given that we have uh, the easing of restrictions. Um, coming into play now, which which obviously puts raises its, its own problems. Yeah, well, chair, in, in regards to to the international travel piece, um, again, a, a task force led by the executive um, office has uh, adopted the hotel quarantine that has come into effect as the start of, of this week for any of the red list countries. So, where in the past where we didn't have and we still don't have uh, many direct or international flights. 
if they were to commence or if people were transiting um, through. We now have that facility here in North Ireland, so that provides that that reassurance for us from, from that point of, of view as well. We do take the guidance the executive has agreed to follow the red list countries as, uh, as guided by JBC uh, through the UK, so there is that consistent approach. There's not a, a large deviation or a large variance between that uh, and the one adopted by the Republic of Ireland. Chair, I will indicate we are still concerned that we're not getting the full uh, data from passenger locator forms coming from the Republic of Ireland. Uh, progress has been made, but there's still uh, still difficulties now in regards to uh, data sharing processes, I think was what the, uh, the Minister of, of Foreign Affairs referred to recently in a joint meeting with the Secretary of State. So uh, where we are currently in regards to, and I think one of our protections here actually is, is the number of, or the small number uh, of uh, indirect or, or direct international flights that we're currently having to manage. So that's 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 keeping us in a pretty a pretty secure place in regards to that. Okay, and that that obviously is significant concern that that's still an issue in in terms of the data protection. What process is in place to deal with that, or how? I mean, it's it's unavoidable. This will cause this will cause problems. Like we we need to crack this. Not would you? I'm sure you do agree with me. <laughs> I, I I I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with you, Chair, as, as does the First Minister, as does the Deputy First Minister. Um, th th this has been raised uh, at quad meetings between ourselves, UK government, Irish government has been raised uh, by the First and Deputy First Minister at UK uh, Prime Minister and First Minister level meetings as well. Um, so it, it is an issue that um, we are moving, as I say, in the right direction. The, the Irish authorities now send out a text message in order to anybody who's travelling uh, to Northern Ireland to complete a UK passenger locator form, but it would give us more of a reassurance and more of a robust approach if we knew um, and had further details and data on who actually was coming into Northern Ireland as well. Okay, okay. Well, that's 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 obviously and and again, and again there, there's more than than simply data sharing that 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 needs to be, I suppose, improved upon in terms of in terms of coordination, but. There's an onus, I think, on everybody to, to do everything they can to address that because obviously the virus is no respecter of, of political differences. It just wants to do, it just wants to transmit. And if we continue to, to allow it, that's what will happen. Um, okay, are you, are you in, and again, this is in the context of we're opening up, we're, we're opening up the, the restrictions. We're going into a period in some ways which may be quite similar to the summer last year where we have transmission quite well down, but also then we're trying to see that return to some sort of normality and allowing, allowing uh, the, the restrictions to ease. Are you confident that the contact tracing, the finding, test, trace, isolate is in place now and robust enough to pick up a COVID transmission generally, but particularly variants of concern that we can really, really press down on those? I, look, I, I am chair, and I think the progress is, that has been made on our TTP systems, um, even since the summer of last year, has been significant. You know, more online, uh, more electronic as well. You know, yourself, you, you've been up and had a presentation from them in regards to that. Um, if you just going to go for the for the last uh, the last data I have, you know, ninety five percent of contacts or or positive case, cases were were traced and uh, contacted. Of their contacts, we were able to get in touch with 99% as well, of those as well. But uh, you know that that system itself has become has become slicker, more efficient, chair. And I think the decision that we took of keeping it in house, keeping it within the PHA rather than subcontracting it uh, to a private company, was the right thing to do because it allows us to give that further health and update advice as well to to anybody that we need to contact. Well, those, those figures, Minister, are based on the on the the electronic and the face to face, or the the, the human to human contact. So it, it includes an element of electronic contact, does it? It does, yes. It includes any positive case that comes into the system as well. And just I suppose my concern is that, and I do welcome actually the announcement that there's going to be more testing of close contacts, uh, what's known as forward forward contacts. Are there any plans, given the success of the backward tracing? Um, that we see where the transmission came from. Are there any plans to expand the testing out to backward tracing back contacts? 
Well, any, any contact can now come forward for, any contact that's indicated can come forward for testing and share, so there, there's no restriction uh, on, on that. If you're identified as a contact at all, you can come forward for testing as well. You know, we have the capability uh, and we have the, the, the volume as well, because as I said, you know, a couple of days last week, we're up to 10,000 tests a day again. You know, and the system didn't. Well, uh, didn't well I, suppose, I, suppose, I suppose my question is more related to are the contact tracers when they contact people saying to them now, so what have your contacts been? Uh, what were they before you spotted symptoms? You know, can we start to go back? So we're, we're currently testing to find people who are at risk of having picked it up from the original test, if you like. Can we now go back and start to track back? We, we have been doing the, the, the backward tracking since October of last year, Chair. Uh, we've been back um, five and seven days in some cases as well. That was a, something that was introduced towards the end of last year that we, we announced. I, and I think we discussed, but uh, I can get you the specifics in regards to that, Chair, but it's something that we, we have been doing within TTP. Yeah, do please get me the, the details on that, Minister, and uh, that, that, will be, that will be useful. Okay, I'm going to go then to members. So at this point in time, I'm going first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I then have in the following order, Carol Nikhilin, Cara Hunter, Jerry Carroll, Jonathan Buckley, Paula Bradshaw and Alan Chambers. So Pam, go ahead there, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Dr. McBride, for your attendance today. I do appreciate um, you, you're very busy, so it's, it's good to have you here again, and appreciate the work you've done over, in particular over the past year. It's been it's been very difficult. The vaccination program obviously is, has been a fantastic success, um, so I think that's to be uh, very much welcomed. And encourage um, others to to take up their vaccine as their entitled to do so um at the same time obviously we're we, we are and you've mentioned the, the the threat of new variants um so there is that need to to um take that collaborative and joint approach in terms of early detection and the appropriate response um i am concerned must have to say over the the issue of the um the impasse over the passenger locator forms that, that it's that it hasn't been resolved after all this time i think it's Quite shameful, actually, that 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 it hasn't been resolved. Uh, in terms of pandemic, I think there's no, um, you know, no more important time to have that um, proper information sharing happening uh, in terms of look, looking out for these new variants coming in. So, um, I, I do have a, a series of questions, and I suppose maybe uh, the first one might be better for Dr. McBride, and it, because it's around. Um, if Dr. McBride, if you could give us um, maybe some uh, words of advice in terms of vaccination for pregnant women um, in relation to the, the JCVI advice. And I was also wanting to ask you, um, Michael, whether um, there's been any movement in terms of a vaccine becoming available for under 16 year olds. That would be um, my first question. Um, for you and and maybe the minister would answer um a question in in terms of uh, relaxation of visiting um in particular for expectant parents and also um i've been contacted by a lot of people you know who have who have um very close relations who are um stroke patients for example and that you know the importance of visitation and the assistance and recovery that that has is incredible and that is a, a big worry that people will not be uh, progressing as well as they should be because of that lack of visitation from um, close family members. Uh, so if you've any update on that for now, um, and then I'll come back with some more questions, that's okay. Um, I thank you, Chair and members. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pam, for the for the question. Uh, just to um, indicate that uh, the. Uh, UK regulator, the MHRA and the EMA have indicated that these are safe and effective vaccines, including um, the uh, in pregnancy. Obviously, in pregnancy, we always take a precautionary approach, and it wasn't at any time that there was a concern around the safety in pregnancy, but rather an absence of ev evidence in relation uh, to pregnancy. And the, the regulators are now confident that uh, these vaccines can be uh, used uh, safely in pregnancy. But as ever, it's important that uh, women uh, who are pregnant uh, have, if they have any concerns, have a conversation with their with their general practitioner um, and weigh up in their own mind uh, the risk benefit 
uh, for themselves in their particular uh, circumstances. That's the recommendation of the JCVI, which uh, we adhere to here in Northern Ireland, and also there have been statements uh, to that effect uh, by the Royal College of Obstetrics uh, and Gynaecology. Uh, turning to your second question then, in terms of under-16s, uh, there are trials uh, underway because obviously a very important um, issue. Uh, we are at the stage only offering vaccination to 80% of the population, so 20% of the, the population, i.e. children, uh, are not vaccinated, and until such times as more of us in the population are, are vaccinated, then um, vaccinating 80%, even with very high uptake, uh, will not hold the virus uh, in its entirety. Uh, those studies in children, uh, we've had early results uh, 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 from the US, there are ongoing studies in the UK, and I anticipate we'll have the results of those studies towards the autumn. Okay, um, i just come in um, on your point, just, uh, just maybe on your first point as well in regards to to vaccine program, and I know this has been a nice but I think it's, it's worthwhile. Uh, when we move to the 35 to 39 year old cohort, uh, we had 29,000 um, uh, tokens within 24 hours. So there has been concerns, you know, about age groups and all the rest of it. We're not seeing that here in Northern Ireland. So again, I would encourage anyone who's now in those eligible eligible criteria uh, to come forward and get that to get their vaccine. In regards to to visiting, this is a, I suppose a challenge that, that we do have in regards to the balance of of what we're doing in regards to to relaxations. Um, we match our, our visiting guidance is matched against the UK threat level uh, for COVID. That's currently set at four. So when you look at our visiting guidance, it's set at the when UK is at a level four. This is how visiting uh, is actually engaged and what's allowed. That's uh, that threat level is reviewed every Friday uh, by the four CMOs. So once that threat level moves from a level four to a level three then our hospital visiting can, can change as well, and that's where we've, we've set that. But there are, and again, um, there, there are circumstances where uh, the need of, of the visit uh, is taken into consideration as well by, by ward managers, by sisters, um, by, you know, by, by care professionals as well as in that balance as well. So it's, it comes down to, to trying to keep the, a standard level of visiting approach across the region but also in specific uh, cases uh, about making it as accessible as possible because we do re realise and we do recognise the additional benefits that come from a visit. Thank, thanks for that, Minister. And, and um, kind of going back to the, the vaccination issue, um, can you talk to us about, um, I mean, it's, it's fantastic, the, the uptake of the vaccine and hopefully that doesn't drop off and people do keep coming forward. But uh, what kind of uh, the rate of vaccinations in Northern Ireland reduce the chances of another wave of COVID in the autumn? The, the more people we have vaccinated, the more people that follow the, the guidance, um, even if there isn't restrictions in place, uh, the less chance there is of a serious wave. It's as, as simple as that. So that's why we're keen that now we are in the 35 to 39 age group that as many people in that age group come forward and get vaccinated. We know that's the group that's going to be, I suppose, more out and about. Uh, uh, and that's the, the group that we want to protect as well, so they're not taking uh, the virus home. But what I do want to uh, re-emphasize re as well, although we've moved to that, that lower age group, we are still seeing people in every other age group still coming forward. So that is people who are uh, maybe were hesitant uh, when their age group was initially called, but have now uh, seen the benefit or, or have had their concerns assuaged um, by the vaccine programme and are still coming forward across those wide range of age cohorts as well. So that it's open now, you know, with vaccine, uh, we have our centres, we have community pharmacy, we have GPs all working to get this out as quickly as possible to as many cohorts as is possible. That's great, Minister. Um, my next question is around um, allied health professionals and transformation. Minister, and uh, could you tell us how the department is future-proofing the vital services provided by AHP, such as speech and language therapists, in the, the planning uh, and transformation of health and social care, given the vital role that um, AHPs 
play within mental health, cancer, stroke, COVID and rehabilitation services. Uh, I think there's, there is a concern that, that they're, they're not really being taken seriously in terms of transformation and that forward planning. So if you could even have funding is being remarked for the continued transformation and integration of AHP into the health service, including the additional undergraduate places offered um, that, that, that you announced. Yeah, well, the, the, the additional undergraduate places that we actually announced are across a number of, of specialities as well. So uh, that de- again, Pam, apologies, I don't have that, that detail with me and it's across uh, all three universities. Uh, Queen's Ulster on open as well, so there are a number of of specialities covered as well. Uh, look, in, in regards to to AHPs, one of the changes that I made in regards to our rebuild management board uh, was actually appoint our chief uh, allied health professional uh, to be a member of it, attending you know attending those meetings as well, because that was something that that wasn't there at the start, but realizing the impact that AHPs have had across. Um, the health service in the past number of months and will have into the future you know and i think that was one of the key and actually one of the successes of the nightingale at the white abbey hospital it was nurse and the hp led so when that recovery piece of work was was being done you know they were getting to work to their the full of their potential and it's our, our allied health professionals are a key part of our profession but we'll get you those the, the specific numbers there uh, in regards to the additional places Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Minister. And going then to Carol Nikhilin. Go ahead, Carol, please. Good morning, uh, Minister, and good morning, um, Dr. McBride. The questions I have are in relation to the neurology services and indeed your statement. While it's very welcome, I'm sure you'll appreciate that it's raised a lot of questions as well. So I'm sure other members of the committee have been contacted by um, members of the public and specifically asking, you know, and you you mightn't have this at hand, but certainly we would welcome um, some clarification on the blood patch patients where previously no clinical evidence was found of uh, intracranial hypertension um, and they never needed blood patches previously. But there's certainly acknowledgement that their car fell well below the standard. So would they be included in uh, the third recall? So that's one um, question on the neurology. The other questions I have, and I'm going to go back to hyponatremia, because again, we have today and even yesterday um, in the media, um, the the uh, scandal around the hyponatremia still with us r- right until today. So, um, Minister, you previously said that you accepted the recommendations of the Justice O'Hara report, but didn't fully commit to accepting all the findings. So I just want to ask you, if you're accepting all the findings, uh, could you also give us the detail of how many clinicians are still being investigated by the GMC? And what impact will they have uh, within the health service, health and social care going forward? And then my last question is, it's really following on from Pam's. I'm seeing a lot of people who had COVID who are left with debilitating recovery. So in relation to respiratory, physio and indeed mental health support, what are what is the department doing in terms of their support? Because I'm working with one constituent, a 42 year old woman who is now on oxygen um, and never had any previously res- previous respiratory illnesses. And it is concerning we hear more uh, of these people coming forward. So um, it, it's up to you, whatever way you want to answer or respond to those questions. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carl. Look, in regards to um, the recall statement yesterday, uh, those aren't easy made. And you know that, uh, and I thank your comment, and I welcome your comment as well, in regards that we're, you know, we're we're writing what has done wrong in the past. That's what I want to do um, as health minister. Uh, in regards to those blood patch patients, um, there was a specific section in the statement to it. I don't have it to hand, uh, but I'll get you an update as to to where they fit in. There is a, there was a number, there was a support number uh, given out in regards to the Belfast Trust, where they were actually given providing. Uh, more information as well, which will also get um, shared with 
with the committee as, as well, uh, because I think it's useful. Um, it's the, the statement yesterday was the right thing to do in regards to bringing forward not just uh, the detail of a third recall, but also the update of the work of the, the second recall as well, because it's about trying to, and as I said to you yesterday in the answer, it's about trying to re-engage people's trust with our health service and the people that work in it. And again, and that follows on, I think, from your second question as well. I don't have the number here being investigated by, by the GMC uh, to hand, but what I will say, the work that we are doing in regards to the consultation that's currently out uh, in the Judea Condor, uh, is a significant piece of work that should not be be underestimated and not come out of, of the hyping between him and John Hart and John Jarrah's recommendations. It's out for a 16-week consultation because it is such a significant piece of work, but it's all about engendering that trust again uh, within our health professionals. All our health professionals um, want to be in that, that sphere where they are trusted by the people who come come forward and need their services as well. And that's what I want to do in, in the time that I have left in this office. Uh, you're sorry, do you want to come back on those? I do, Minister, and I appreciate, um, and I said to you when you made your statement on Tuesday, that a lot of stuff didn't happen on your watch and you said you didn't care, you want to sort it out, and I'm accepting you want to do that. But see, particularly in relation to the neurology, the allegations that were made were about cover-up. Okay, and while the consultation is out on a duty of candor, and the fact that you have uh, Ian, uh, Professor Ian Young, uh, his court of, or his appearance yesterday, his uh, judicial process yesterday, and you have again um, a, a Dr. John Hanrahan facing a fitness hearing test. Uh, I do think, and I mean, like even for any, if anybody's listened to this, particularly Claire Roberts' family, I think we need to hear that in relation, same as your neurology, we need to in some way try to right the wrongs that were done in the past. So um, I think that's what we need to hear because like you, I want people to trust the trusts. I want people to go forward. I want them to do it in com with confidence. And at the minute, particularly because there's still ongoing cases in relation to hyponatremia, the trust in that process has been rocked. So that um, Yeah, no, I, I look, and in regards, you know, to those, uh, in regards to hyponatremia, of, of the 96 recommendations have all been accepted. And I think, Chair, if I'm right, I think the Permanent Secretary is coming to do a presentation uh, to the committee or has been asked to as well in, in those specifics as well. Um, Carlos, what is it about how, how we engender that? Uh, in regards to uh, in regards to Professor Ian Young, his advice and, and support to me as Chief Scientific Advisor over this pandemic has been invaluable, and I really appreciate what he's given uh, and what he still can can give as well. And his position remains unchanged uh, as far as I'm concerned at this moment in time. Uh, in regards to that, because of, of the advice and the professional ability that that he has brought. Uh, in regards to your other point, and uh, it um, has been described, and again, I know it's something that you, you have raised, and it's something that Paula has raised as well, and that's in regards to long COVID. Uh, now, I've, I've specifically asked the Health and Social Care Board to come forward with uh, recommendations as to what uh, that support um, looks like. Um, what we are doing is taking that, and again, it's going to, you know, there's allied health professional input into it as well. Um, because it isn't just about the physical side, there's also about the, the mental health challenges as well. So what we've done and what we're doing is looking at what's been done elsewhere. England have set up uh, specific clinics. Scotland and Wales haven't because they're taking a different approach yet again. So we're, we are in the Health and Social Care Board has come forward with recommendations as to what, what that actually looks like and where it's best placed. You know, is it best placed within a trust setting? Is it best placed within a primary care setting? Uh, and where people can actually access it easier as well. So, so that work is well advanced, but we want to make sure that as a package, when it's delivered, it's the right package, and it's not piecemeal, or we don't have to start adding to it. Michael, do you maybe want to touch on the long COVID? Very, very, brief, very briefly, please, because I want to get, uh, I need to move on soon to other members. Go ahead, Michael. Chair, Chair, can I just come in before Michael moves on? Sorry, very for briefly. And it's just, just to say this, 
Robin, and I just want to say it to you because I don't want you saying it on Twitter or in the media. So what I heard you say was you accepted O'Hara's recommendations, but you don't accept the findings. And, and Carl, I accept the full report. The department has accepted the full report. We've never broken it down into anything else. Okay, okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go then to Chara Hunter. Um, Chara, go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, uh, folks, and thank you for being here uh, and your continued efforts over the past year are, are well appreciated. Um, my question refers to um, as we approach the uh, 35 to 39 age group and as the vaccine rolls out, uh, my question refers to uptake. Um, have we seen a change? Has it dropped or is it fairly consistent? And do you foresee any issues with uptake as we get to the younger age groups? Um, Cara, we, we haven't seen the concern yet. Um, in regards to that, and I think the chair indicated earlier on, our levels of over 50s were sitting at 90 percent. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, specific numbers yet on the lower the co cohorts. We went live uh, with our 35 to 39 age group at two o'clock uh, in the afternoon. By close of play that evening, we had 791 people in that cohort vaccinated. 24 four hours later, there was nearly 3,000. Vaccinated, so we're not seeing any any hesitancy at the early stages. Maybe as we get further in uh, and further down, there may we may see that. But I think it's reassuring that the people see the value that the vaccination program is actually bringing, and, and the guidance that we, we've received, and the statements that have come out from MHRA, uh, European Medical Association, World Health Organization, in regards to how the benefits of this vaccine outweigh the risks. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, my next question refers to, um, so vaccine hesitancy is an issue for all of us. Um, and when engaging with constituents who are hesitant to get the vaccine, um, they had referred to concerns or that they don't feel there's enough information on long-term effects of the vaccine or if there are any. Um, what can we tell them today to put them at ease and to ensure um, that vaccine uptake continues? Michael, do you want to pick up on that? Yes, uh, happy, happy to do so. Thank you, Cara. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, obviously, these are vaccines uh, which are approved by, uh, are authorised by the regulator. Uh, the MHRA is a world-renowned reputation in terms of the uh, primacy that it affords, the safety, the effectiveness of vaccine. Um, they're also approved by the European uh, Medicines Agency. Uh, and I would just like to take this opportunity to assure everyone that the safety of people who receive the vaccines is the primary uh, consideration in all of this. These are safe uh, and effective vaccines. Clearly, uh, there is an ongoing program of uh, review. We have the yellow card scheme, uh, where all doctors right across the United Kingdom report any uh, potential side effects associated with the vaccine or adverse consequences associated with the vaccine, and that's an ongoing process. So it doesn't stop with the authorization. We will continue to look for uh, short term, medium term, and, and any potential or longer term uh, adverse consequences associated with the vaccine. But there is no evidence uh, at this time of any long term uh, problems with vaccine. So, you know, when your turn comes, uh, get the jab, and that's the best way to protect yourself, your family, and those people around you who are vulnerable. And I think for young people, that's the important message. COVID may provide less of a risk to them, but it still is a risk. Uh, to those people who are closer to them who are older because remember the vaccine may not work for everyone and may not work for older people as well as it does in younger people thank you um i have another question just around um i had spoken recently with an individual who had their first vaccine here in northern ireland and uh, due to work and study commitments they've had to return to england can i just ask for some clarity around is there a mechanism to book um your second vaccine elsewhere um, or how does that work? Michael, let you pick that specific again. Yes, uh, we have we provided a range of flexible approaches for that sort of scenario where, for instance, individuals who reside in England who have got uh, during the lockdown uh, were residing in Northern Ireland and uh, we have, uh, we're not, obviously not able to access their GP in the UK. Uh, so we have a range of circumstances in terms of students, for instance. Um, uh, where indeed we have facilitated that. So again, we look at every case uh, on a case by case basis. And certainly if there is a, a genuine issue such as that you've described with them, uh, we will uh, take a flexible approach and that's the right and proper thing to do. 
Tara, if you want to send the details into the private office or, or, or through the committee clerk, we can pick up on, on that issue. Thank you, Minister. And then lastly, uh, Minister, this would most likely be for yourself. Um, just an update um, on uh, COVID passports, where we are and what kind of conversations and considerations have been taking place. Um, there has been conversations being had at a, a UK government level as to how they can be introduced, what they, what they will look like and what they will gain um, access to. Look, I have said here before, I've said again, it's not something that lies easily to, to me um, from a personal or political point of view that you need a, a certificate or a passport to get into a, a pub or a restaurant or even into a place of worship. It just does not, doesn't sit comfortably. But could it be some a, a certificate that allows or, or enables international travel or allows attendance at a, a large scale public event where there's no social distancing? Those conversations are being had and I think something that could be explored as a a usefulness uh, while we come out of these, uh, while we come out of our, our, our restrictions as well, as to enable them to facilitate more, but certainly something that should not become the norm. Uh, in regards to certain criteria, look, we already have, uh, in certain cases, for some countries of Africa, require uh, vaccine certification against yellow fever uh, and things like that. But it, it's not something that's been generally talked about at this moment in time. But if it's something that can facilitate international travel. Or, or large scale events, I think it's something that could be voluntary uh, looked at and taken up. Okay, thank you, Mr. And thank you, uh, Dr. McBride. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> and moving then to Jerry, Carol, go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister and CMO. Uh, morning. Um, first round of questions, Minister, is around uh, pay and pay review. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of consternation and concern amongst people who've seen the, the offer, the 1% offer from the Tories, uh, and people thought it was a slap in the face for all the work that they've done uh, in the last um, year and beyond. I know, I know you've been on record of thanking NHS staff, you know, pretty much every statement that you made, and I'm sure people appreciate that they do um, but there's a concern that um, there may be a similar offer um, being made to staff here so a couple of questions around that um, when, when will a decision be made by the pay review body um, what input do you have as a minister do you make recommendations do you submit a, a proposal do you submit a um, or does your department sub submit a proposal or, or a thought on that um, and your own view what would what, what do you think um, NHS workers uh, deserve as a, as a pay raise you probably would say something like you can't pay them enough and I would agree with that but uh, I think they need, they need something tangible uh, at least to keep them in the NHS and, and hopefully um, go some way towards recognising the important work uh, that they did and also there's a there's a lot of concern with the uh, the one percent offer uh, the finance minister made to public sector workers. So people uh, are seeing a pattern uh, of uh, pay cuts and, and no significant pay increases. So I just wanted to, to ask your uh, your view on that, but also uh, what input do you have directly as minister in regards to the pay review body? Um, thanks, Jerry. Um, and, and you're right. And well, I'll, I'll take your quote as to what you think I would say, but I think I'm on record as acknowledging. Um, our health workers, and that's why um, we brought forward the acknowledgement payment as well that we, we're processing through. Uh, the independent review body is due to publish its report in May, so it's not far away. It's an independent review body, uh, and we take our recommendations um, from it. We do supply an input as a department as to uh, conditions in Northern Ireland. We didn't put in a percentage. Uh, it's not our place. It's up to the independent review pay body to, to do that and come forward with those recommendations. Uh, there's the knock-on effect then in regards to, to Barnet, because one of the things uh, as well that we did coming out of the industrial action last year was pay or pays with England as well. So whatever happens across there happens here too. Uh, in regards to the announcement from uh, the finance minister in regards to public sector pay, that statement actually said that health and um, social care workers weren't included uh, and that so they do I, I know it may cause consternation with other workforces but in regards to where we are um, I, I think it was welcome because it does allow should the independent review panel uh, recommend over that one percent were not tied by any statement that's already been made here but it's also about the, the additional finances that we get as well to award that pay review body as well 
uh, an increase uh, in Westminster equates to about 80% of what we need here because we include uh, our, our social care as well as within our pay review body, whereas it's not in England, Scotland and Wales. So we do have, have to find additional body, monies as well, but th there has to be a commitment and an acknowledgement uh, from the executive and from the assembly of what our, our staff have done during the last year and then actually what they are worth. Thanks, Minister. Uh, just a, a quick uh, on that, so, so to clarify, there, there wasn't a, a percentage proposal submitted by the department, but that there could have been in, in theory. And uh, beyond the um, the the payment, the one off payment, uh, has there been any uh, discussions at the executive about increasing the the pay long term uh, going forward uh, by yourself or, or any other ministers on the executive? Not until we re we receive the report from the independent review. Body, Jerry, you know, and I think that's that's the right place for that conversation to start, and that's why it was established as an independent body that would take their their guidance and advice from. Thank you, and just finally on that, Minister, just when the review um, makes their when the the body sorry makes their report to the executive, the executive uh, um, says whether they implement it or not. Obviously, yeah. Well, the executive will um, have to sign off on any additional monies that I need because you know, I, I think if there is something that's outside, um, some of the additional costs to, to, to our budget, there's money that has to be found elsewhere because it, it doesn't, uh, it wouldn't, I, I think, be an, an, easy, an easy set to, to ask us to find additional monies within an already stretched budget. I think there'll be a need across the executive and even from part of consequential way to Westminster um, that anything that additional has to be recognised because it is from that independent body review as well. And I, I'm sure you will notice that's why some of our, our union colleagues are already lobbying MPs at Westminster to make sure that any increase uh, that, that is given is also funded here as well for us. Thanks, Minister. And I just uh, want to put on the record, I know, speaking to health workers, that if there's an offer of 1% or, or even 2%, percent it cause a lot of anger amongst workers who have been through the mill and sacrificed a hell of a lot in the last year. And I'm sure you, you, you probably agree with that. Um, just want to move on there. I've got a few minutes left there. Um, Minister, I've been contacted by... Um, some some uh, neurology uh, patients, um, and there's obviously you know they're, they're quite concerned about the, the, the latest information uh, and the, the the regular feature of uh, of this in the news. Um, but some have suggested to me that there, there could be an issue around um, cases, legal cases, uh, potentially being being lost. Uh, I'm I'm assuming it's by the uh, legal team in the possibly in the department, but I'll I'll seek a bit of clarification on that. Um, and there appears to be a delay from from the legal team in the department to respond uh, to patients. There's letters of protocol submitted, uh, and people are waiting on a response back. Uh, assuming again from the department uh, uh, on that. So. Um, could you sort of shed some light on that? Do you have any understanding of this? And, and I can forward the detail in writing after the committee if, if, if necessary, but it's something that has been raised with me just late uh, yesterday evening, and it does seem to be quite concerning because these are people, obviously, who have been through the mill already. Uh, you said, obviously, you don't want to have any undue uh, delay for them to get answers, and I think people take you... Uh, take your word uh, for that, but um, to me, this suggests there could be concerns around delaying uh, um, legal cases and legal responses. So, um, appreciate that you may not have heard that information, but do you have any sense of, of anything that's going on in that? Jerry, uh, Jerry, it's not it's not something that has been raised with me or, or something to recognise. So, look, get if you can get those details to me, uh, certainly someone will give you an answer to. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. And so I'm going now then to Jonathan Buckley, then Paula, then Alan, then Orlea. Um, so Jonathan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, and thanks, Chief Medical Officer, and good morning to you all. Um, Minister, the, the vaccination programme and the success of it here has quite rightly focused minds on the supply of medicines. Uh, last week's Health Committee, the Department recognised that 98% of medicine supply and medical goods and devices travel to Northern Ireland through GB mainland. There's been much talk in the media about the damage that the protocol does to GB NI access. Is the minister concerned regarding the effects of the protocol 
on the supply of medicines into Northern Ireland once this derogation period ends, and what action is he personally taking to address this issue? Um, thanks, Johnny. Yes, it is something that concerns me uh, in regards, and that's why uh, we have been engaged uh, quite significantly uh, in regards to this. The derogation period for, for medicines was one of the longest that was actually agreed at the start, which gave us to the end of this year, actually, to get things sorted out and in a better place. Um, everyone thought that work was progressing well until the EU triggered Article 16 over vaccines. Uh, that unnerved people, that unsettled people, and that has, I suppose, increased uh, the level of concern that we're seeing, especially from more uh, the smaller, the more intricate suppliers of medicines uh, and medical devices. In regards to what we're doing, we have been intensively engaged uh, since the protocol was first announced and the impact it would have on the pharmaceutical industry and our medicines and medical devices. We are working collaboratively uh, across industry uh, with the, the MHRA, the Medicines Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, and the Department of Social Care in England. Um, th this piece of work has actually been headed up, headed up by uh, Minister Agar uh, in Westminster, who I, I meet uh, on a, a regular basis to discuss these issues as to how we can actually, actually take them forward and what the solutions are. Uh, a lot of these solutions um, lie with discussions between UK government uh, and the EU, and that's where the, the challenge will be. We'll input into them and continue to work in regards to, to the effect of further derogations as we need, because it's un, it would be unacceptable that our, our medicines or medical devices are impacted on the supply of them. We are a small part um, of, the over, of the overall UK market in regards to many of these big pharma companies, and I see no reason why we should be treated differently. Thank you for that, Minister. And, and given the, the plurethora of legal actions that are now coming forward in relation to the protocol and its dis discriminatory and, and difficulties that it's now causing to the people of Northern Ireland, most primar primarily in relation, probably in my view, to the supply of medicines, has the Minister considered any potential legal action in relation to the impact of the protocol? I would say not in regards to where we stand, uh, Johnny, as I say, that, that interaction is between UK government uh, and the EU. Um, so I know the legal approaches that have been taken at the minute are on the larger scope of the protocol on the basis around that. So it's not something that we've specifically looked at uh, as, a, as a department. We engage regularly, as I said, with MHRA, DHSC, and also the NIO um, on these issues as well. Okay, Minister, maybe you could just confirm for me, it's, there's obviously been a lot of conversation at, at this committee in relation to this particular item, uh, but with 98% of the medicines and medical devices market for Northern Ireland being G GB, and given that we are such a small region, um, could the Minister confirm that if Northern Ireland left uh, the European Union on the same terms as the rest of GB, that they would not be facing the issues that have presented themselves by means of the protocol in relation to medicines and medical devices to Northern Ireland? I enjoy that, that is a political question. And from my point of view, um, as an Ulster Unionist Health Minister, I, I would agree, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Minister and Chief Medical Officer. Um, I, I, I need to start. Sir, um, could you give us an update on the £500 um, payment for the carers, please? Uh, thanks, Paula. In regards to the specific uh, payment for the carers, uh, there is now, and I've asked for a cross-departmental group at the executive level to see how this can be progressed, because I think, as we've said at the start and indicated at the start, carers don't simply fall uh, under health, they fall under education, they fall under other committees as well, or, or other departments as well. So that piece of work is on go on. It's not as far as advanced as, as I would like it to be. But what I have done in the meantime uh, in Bendrum is awarded four million to a number of carers organisations so they can provide uh, additional support for carers in the meantime while they progress that. Um, Minister, I appreciate that. I, I, I think um, a lot of carers actually felt quite affronted that that money was released to the groups instead of the individuals. I have a carer, for example, who is having to hand wash her son's sheets 
in the sink because their washing machine's broken down. So this is vital money to a lot of carers who have been battling through COVID. So I appreciate it's cross-departmental, but please be uh, aware that some of the carers were actually quite um, uh, annoyed that they that the groups got it, but the individuals didn't. Um, well, on... And sorry, Paula, just b b before you go in regards to that, that, that money's going to be uh, actually managed and put out through the, the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland in regards to those, those carers' organisations and how they support individual carers as well, so it's not a specific uh, issue as well. We did engage with carers' organisations in regards to how that four million could actually be utilised uh, to further support carers, so it's not it's not an affront uh, to carers, and then look, uh, it's not the way it was intended, but I wanted to give money to those organisations who have been providing vital support uh, centrally for a lot of carers across Northern Ireland, and that was why I made the announcement in regards to, to that specific funding. Well, not to labour it, Minister, but uh, I don't think that a lot of the carers have time to then make an application. I, I believe in the past when they've gone for other small pots of money, it was actually worse than a PIP assessment, trying to justify why they needed this money for, for their vulnerable relatives. Um, the second question... Uh, so, sorry, Paul, in, in regards to that, that's why you know, this, this money and, and I've made it delivered. You know, it's going to sit outside uh, the department, uh, and that's why it's sitting with our, you know, the organisation, and we'll go down to the organisation so they can decide uh, what the criteria are as to how they support uh, carers individually. Okay. Okay, thank you, Minister. Second question relates to uh, when the movement and the change of policy around visiting and accompanying um, loved ones to antenatal appointments, for example, in the trust. Is there any move um, to actually start less, uh, um, uh, removing some of the restrictions? Yeah, no, I, I think, Paul, I don't know if you picked up, I know Pam, Pam asked the same uh, question around the same issue. Uh, we, we match our visiting guidance to the UK alert level in regards to, to COVID as well. That UK level is at level four, so there is a direct route across on visiting uh, guidance. In regards to that, the alert level is assessed every every Friday by the four CMOs, and that's where we take our, our move. The, the guidance was last moved. I think we moved from level five to level four uh, back at the start, start of March, but it's something that we constantly... Um, keep on the review as well and there's many scenarios and many supports where we do uh, at, at a local level where possible uh, facilitate additional visit and additional supports as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, moving on then to the issue that the Chair um, referenced at the start of that, sorry, oral cancers. We had a, a fantastic presentation yesterday from Dr. Jeremy McKenna, who's a consultant sort of um, dentistry uh, um, in the Belfast Health Trust. He gave a very, very stark presentation around what he is seeing coming through his clinics now, stage four, three, stage four presentations of very, very advanced cancer in, in the mouth and throat. Um, linked to that, Minister, as you know, that the best way of screening for oral cancers are our... <laughs> Policy around the restriction of practice of our GPs. Obviously, there was the issue of the aerosol generating procedures, but also um, a wider issue, Minister, and that's in relation to people getting in front of their GPs. I think Dr. Almstein tweeted this um, last week or so that about 30% of appointments are now face to face. When are we going to get to the point where we can see a larger number of our GPs? Um, actually bringing people in so they can actually look inside their mouths. I know dentists are better placed, but etc. When are we going to see our, our GPs fully open and dentists? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, put Paula uh, as soon as possible. Sorry, Minister, just, just, just before you start that, now there is some background noise. I just checked that all members who are not speaking are on mute. There was like a rustle of noise that obscured a small part of Paula's. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just asking members and everyone else to mute, make sure you're on mute while not speaking. Thank you. Go ahead, Minister. Okay. Um, thanks, Chair. No, Paula, look, um, back to that normal procedure as, as soon as possible uh, and as soon as it's safe to do so. And in regards to, to dentistry, again, we put more, and, and specifically the challenges that's come around uh, are through the, the, the aerosol generating procedures. Uh, we gave uh, additional supports to dentistry earlier this year in regards to actually improving ventilation as well. Um, I think Michael Donaldson attended your meeting as well, or acting chief dental officer. It was great to have him there, Minister. Yeah. Yes. You know, so so Mike, Michael continues to do that work uh, along with 
with colleagues across the industry as well. What we will be doing short, shortly as well was actually in regards to Public Health England um, has produced, uh, I think it's the fourth edition of their oral, and uh, as an oral health improvement document that they talk about uh, delivering better oral health. Um, we've actually signed up, we'll be a co, um, co logo, co sponsor of that as well, so that it will be available to Northern Ireland dentists as well, which will allow them to do, do that piece of work as well, as well. So it takes that step forward as to, to different um, evidence based interventions and advice uh, that can actually improve patients' oral health as well. But your point is that people need to be in front of their dentist to be seen, and that's what we're we're trying to get back to as well, um, as quickly as possible. And you know, you've had the presentations from the GPs as well. The GPs want people in front of them as well, um, because they think that, I think there's a point I made in the past when many uh, people go in to see a GP, it's not what they go in to see them about, it's what they say on the way out the door that often triggers that, you know, do you want to sit down and talk about that? And that's where we have to get back to uh, as safely as possible and look at our rebuilding plans as we normalise more of society, it's how quickly we can get back to that, but support our GPs and our dentists in doing it safely as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, so, um, the Department of Health, PV vaccination for adolescent boys. So um, I'm just conscious, we as a society are more conscious of the benefits of vaccination. Again, the presentation very much demonstrated that, for example, men, I think, was three times more likely to have an or, um, have an oral cancer. Is there any way that you or, uh, or the Health and Social Care Board or Public Health Agency are looking to maybe roll back um, to those boys who are still in school, who, who maybe were just outside the age group for the vaccination that they could be brought in um, for, for, to be vaccinated? And in other words, expand the category. It's not something that I'm aware of, Paula, but now you've raised it, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at it and back to you on that specific. Okay, thank you. And finally, Chair, just very quickly, I'm not expecting very to quickly, go. But I, 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 a whistleblower has come to me in the last 24 hours, and I think Nolan's picked up on it this morning around renal surgery and the Belfast Trust. I haven't got the full details, Minister, but if I was you, I think I would be getting busy trying to find out what was actually happening in that department. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paula. Um, uh, Alan Chambers, go ahead, Alan, please. We're not hearing you, Alan. Can you check your mute? We're still not. We're still not picking you up, Alan. We're only able to hear you, Alan. Okay, what I will do is then I will go to our Leah Flynn and we'll come back to Alan in the hope that he can sort that issue out on his end. So I'll go across to you, our Leah. Go ahead, please. Um, thank you. Um, so just quickly then, um, Minister, maybe just to bring it back to the concerns that you flagged up at, at the beginning around the um, the data sharing with, with the South. I'm just wondering, because it made me think of um, the, the one of the urgent orals that was asked on the floor of the Assembly, if you remember, um, when there was communication issues with North and South around um, the, the vaccination process, the vaccine, um, and in, in some of your answers to the floor of the Assembly that day, obviously there was communication concerns flagged up at that stage. And just from memory, Minister, I think you were talking about trying to obviously deal with those issues and, you know, find ways of, of enhancing the MOU or just to make sure that, you know, you're not battling against these things in the future. And I'm thinking, obviously, with the Indian variant, with restrictions easing in the north, you know, um, I think now more than ever, it's really, really important. The communication is completely streamlined um, across the island. So could you maybe just elaborate a wee bit more on what the, the, the difficulties actually are? Is it just in relation to the data sharing or is it, you know, more broadly around communication when, when we think back to the vaccination problem that we had? And, um, and how much, you know, cooperation is actually taking place with the South at present? Um, or, or the, I think what I would say, at uh, professional level, there's very good engagement um, through CMOs, public health agencies, even the officials who are dealing with the, the data sharing issue. Uh, when it comes to some of the decision making and communications at certain levels, I think that's where the challenge starts, starts to come in as well. Uh, because I suppose there, there's discussions at political level uh, and decisions that have to be made uh, at different governments and different governments as to how those are taken forward. But uh, I would say in regards to 
the interaction at official level, CMO level, it's still highly professional, still still good, still strong. Uh, and look, we're seeing that in the Northwest in regards to uh, where we're seeing a, a larger number of cases in Derry City and Straban City Council. You know, there's good cooperation across border there between uh, public health agencies and also local councils as to the bit of messaging uh, that needs to be very specifically targeted at that point. So look, the communication, the engagement's still good. The decision making at times is the challenging bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and just maybe for your own information, Minister, um, it is part of this committee's forward work programme over the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll hopefully be doing a joint um, meeting with the, the, the health committee in the, the south with the two CMOs. So we're in any way that we can help assist to try and strengthen that, that process and that communication. Um, you know, just let us know because it's important that, that, yous, that yous have that. Um, then, just finally, I know it's been touched on a couple of times, Pam and, and Paula mentioned it just around the, um, I know we're getting the briefing around the um, the, the resumption of services, but um, the the it's really more broadly around the women's health. So I know there's been meetings done recently around people that have been waiting years upon years on uh, waiting lists for um, people suffering with endometriosis. I'm conscious that the mesh clinic in Belfast is still closed and there's a lot of women out there still living in, in, in daily pain. And and then I'm also thinking about the maternity services and all the pressures that's on women and men and families that, that's going to have babies. And you mentioned there around the visiting guidance that's obviously um, you as much that to the UK threat level and those meetings take place every Friday. Uh, Minister, do we have any capacity to assess our own alert level? Um, I know at this stage, maybe, you know, it's not worthwhile even, you know, um, looking into it, but can that be done? Because I'm just conscious of people living here locally who want access to those visits. And just on the broader point around the mesh and the endometriosis and, and the more broader sort of women's health care issues, the, the Women's Health Care All Party Group, we did send a letter into the, the Department of Health, into your department um, back in March around the maternity visitation. We'll have another meeting tomorrow and it's just to say we welcome the opportunity to work really closely with yourself as Minister to try and help champion um, those issues. And just finally then on the mental health issues, um, I know that uh, we got a letter back in the correspondence in the papers last week around the, the second opinion of people needing their medication, you know, that, that second opinion exceeding over the three months around the pressures on mental health inpatient units and, and obviously the staff and pressures that the department and the health service is under. So it's very hard to increase capacity for these things when you haven't got the staff. But I would like to just put it on record that I have really serious concerns around CD addictions and the dual diagnosis issues. They're not going away and they're getting a hell of a lot worse. Um, myself and Carl, I'm sure every member on this health committee, we're actually now dealing with daily cases of people in crisis through addiction, through mental health crisis, with nowhere to go or getting turned away from A&E. So I know the crisis review is hopefully getting published this month, but it's really just to emphasise, Minister, I know we'll have these strategies coming up, but I think we need to look at some, doing something in the immediate term because there's, I mean, we're just we're just dealing with so many individuals and families that, that just aren't getting the help for probably for a number of reasons, but that was just to put that, that on record. And if you confirm, can confirm if that crisis review is coming out this month, thanks, thanks very much. Um, no, um, thanks, Orla, and, and thanks for your thanks for your your, your detailed and dedicated uh, work work in, in these areas. Uh, the crisis review, I don't have a specific date uh, here. I know we are committed to, to issue it uh, soon. In regards to the dual diagnosis support, you know, it's something you've raised many times, and it's something that that we are looking at in regards to how we make sure people are seen at the right time in the right place, rather than creating additional services. It is something that's you know, in the mental health uh, strategy, the consultation that's currently out at this moment in time, and I know you'll, you'll feed that in, into that as well. In regards to the letter that, that came in in March, I don't see, I, I'm not aware of a formal response yet. I'll follow it up uh, as well. Uh, can I say, maybe, maybe just in regards to that group that's meeting, if, if it's useful, maybe they have some input from the department as well. Uh, I'm sure, you know, our department officials or our senior officers are more willing to engage. And I think, you know, as, as Paul indicated yesterday, you know, our chief uh, dental officer attended that meeting in regards to, to, to oral health and, and in relation to cancer as well. So, you know, I don't know if the chief nursing officer will be short notice for her to attend tomorrow, but maybe somewhere down the line and maybe something you want to consider, you know, or inviting to the oral party group. So, uh, you know, I know, I know you say, you know, working with me, but make sure you get the right, 
a facial contact as well, mm -hmm. uh, building in there, maybe somebody from the CMO's team uh, as well to build into that as well. In regards to, to the challenges that we face, look, you, you have to nail on the head capacity. You know, and it is about the people that we, we currently have in the system working to, to the maximum and they are because they're all dedicated health professionals and we're lucky to, to have a lot of them as well. But it's made, uh, the challenges as well in regards to, to, to mental health and how we support further people and further organisations as well as part of that additional support fund that I announced. Now I'm, I'm building around the details so that there is actually the full package there as to who can access it and who, who can engage in it and who can draw down for it. My ideal would be it's people on the ground, it's the voluntary community, it's the people who are who, who are picking up the pieces before they become serious problems that actually have to come into the health service. It's those early interventions, it's those prevention measures uh, that mean so much and that supports the work that's actually been done through uh, and the recommendations that are in the mental health strategy uh, and the action plan that's already published. And just on that, sorry, um, Minister, on the, the, the alert system, the alert, alert level system for the, the visitation, is there any capacity to, do we look at that, like, you know, just based here locally? We, we are part of the, the organisation that actually takes uh, that decision as the, as the four chief medical officers, so it's not just solely England based, so Michael sits on that group that, that looks at it. The recommendation comes from, um, I'm trying to think of its name now, uh, Michael, it's, it has a input from our... JBC, uh, joined by a medical committee. Uh, medical there you go. Uh, you know, we, 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 we have input to that as well, so that guidance comes, or the input actually comes from ourselves as well. But as I say, in regards to individual cases or individual uh, facilities, the can't facilitate greater visiting. You know, they are being, people are being supported as much as we can, as safely as we can. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Elliot. Um, going then, hopefully, back to the, you're hearing a lot of noise on, on background noise of a, a kind of like a rustling, but I'm not sure if that's um, impacting on Alan. But I'm going to go back and try to pick Alan up again. Alan, can you hear us there at present? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Chair? We're, we're, hearing you, we're hearing you now, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chairman, just uh, earlier uh, in the meeting, we, we talked about the passenger location uh, data forms, and, and that's disappointing that that hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, but the, um, you asked the, uh, the Minister about the, uh, if the Indian variant had appeared in Northern Ireland, and he assured us it hasn't, but he had said that there was three cases in the Republic of Ireland, and uh, he indicated that he had learned about that through the media. Um, I'd be quite disappointed if, if, if our health minister has to learn such important uh, and impactful uh, information through the media. So um, the other thing then is in relation to the vaccine programme, and I, would, I would wish to ask the minister for an update uh, of the, how the, vaccine, the vaccinating is going through our uh, community pharmacists. I know that on the ground, the feedback I'm getting is that it's going extremely well and that the, uh, the pharmacists have definitely uh, stepped up to the, uh, the challenge. And my last question is around the, um, there does seem to be a little bit of resistance among the younger uh, groups and the 20 year olds, are, are, it seems to be like a marmite effect in relation to getting the vaccine. Uh, and I'm just wondering, does the vaccine team have campaign plans to counter any resistance uh, uh, among our younger population towards getting the vaccine? Thank you. Um, well, thanks, Al. Look, um, the, the community pharmacy side of our, our vaccine programme is key because it's one of the things we wanted to do is bring the vaccine as close to people as possible. So we've over 300 community pharmacists um, actually delivering vaccines as well. I got mine and and a community pharmacy, and I think close of play yesterday, we were, we were just shy of community pharmacy having delivered uh, just shy of 21,000 vaccines. So a key key part of, of of that overall program as well. So in regards to the hesitancy, and again, as we move through the age cohorts, we are still seeing early and just early uptake. Um, I think in the, the first 24 hours with 29,000 uh, people in that age group, 35 to 39, come on and book a slot. What it is, is you get through and you get lower down into the, the lower cohorts as well. So 
the message uh, and there will be a public information campaign to move from I think UK government centrally but also us, us locally in regards to the benefit and the benefit of a younger person getting the vaccine is to keep their loved ones safe it may not be to protect them but it's for their parents their grandparents as well who have already come forward and taken the vaccine thank you Okay, yeah, to the back, to the back, nice coming in there. If everyone can just go on to mute again, anyone who's not who's not speaking. Um, okay, listen, Minister and, and Chief Medical Officer, thank you uh, again for appearing today. There's a couple of issues there where you have uh, indicated, Minister or CMO, that you would provide some further information back to committee, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I am conscious, Michael, that we didn't get back to, to you, Minister was going to take you in in terms of the long COVID and what plans are in place, but maybe you could provide a written briefing to the committee in relation to the plans in place for long COVID. Um, I think that's, that's an issue of concern as we move forward. Um, in relation to the, uh, the the cures payments, Minister, did you say that those those that there is still a scheme being worked on with other departments in as to how we get an individual payment in recognition of how much cures lost services in for a start uh, were placed under additional pressure in their care and role, including financial pressure. That would only be a kind of a, an acknowledgement. It wouldn't probably cover cover very much. But is there any is there any indications in terms of the cross departmental work as to when we could expect a scheme to be brought forward for cures? There, there's not at this time, Chair. Uh, it's something that I've asked for to be taken forward at official level to start with because it is it does cross so many departments, you know, as they say, ourselves, uh, communities, education, even justice to an extent as well, to make sure that and part of the challenge, and I've had this conversation in the past, Chair, part of the challenge challenge is we do not have a central carers register. Uh, that covers all carers across Northern Ireland. As I say, that was the intention of the early four million going into our carers organisation uh, organisations, uh, so that they can start to provide some uh, supports and mechanisms and financial uh, acknowledgements to some of those carers. Uh, it doesn't cover uh, or recognise all the sacrifices in the meal. I don't think any payment will uh, acknowledge that commitment that they've given to their loved ones over the past past fourteen months. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And um, in relation to the full re restoration of daycare and respite services, have you any indication as to when those services can be put back in place to, to support carers? They are being brought back uh, on, on a gradual basis, uh, Chair, again, but a part of the challenge in respite, again, is in social distancing. Um, I know the conversation has been had, you know, in regards to the person supporting somebody who needs respite, you know, there is challenge in, in, in social distancing there. That's actually how many people we can put into a respite facility to keep not just the individuals uh, supported through social distance, but also those who are supporting them in regards to their carers uh, and the health professionals as well. So it's working on a reduced footprint, but those those services are being scaled up. They're being scaled up slowly, but it is something that trusts are, are fully aware that we want to get back to uh, full capacity as soon as possible. And when I say full capacity, Chair, even that full capacity uh, was underutilised, or no, sorry, not on. Sorry, apologies. Uh, wasn't enough uh, prior to COVID. Uh, it was fully utilised because there wasn't enough of it. So the challenges are still remain there. And and has has there been any kind of audit done in terms of how we could provide additional space? So recognising that the distance is is an issue and the capacity that is an issue. Are there are there other buildings or premises within the health and social care domain that could be brought into play in a temporary basis to provide additional resources? Because of the the facilities that are needed, you know, if you're, if you're talking about respite care, even you know, which looks around overnight care or or you know, staying away from home, we don't have many spare facilities that would meet that criteria that could be opened up very quickly. Column that actually looks, you know, the thing about respite care, it should be a home away from home. Rather than somebody going into, you know, an, an, uh, an additional medical facility or a medical facility where there's there's additional capacity, so it's been making sure that the, the facility. I, I don't have a large footprint to work on uh, across Northern Ireland that would meet that sort of definition, uh, but it's something I, I know we need to expand uh, our respite services. 
Okay. Okay. And then just just uh, just finally, then in relation to the the earlier question I'd asked, and you said you hadn't had a chance to consider providing the minutes of those me meetings that we had asked for. Um, and I suppose it's it's, a, it's disappointing that after this period of time you haven't had that chance. But I'm just wondering, genuinely wondering, um, what type of content would would mean that you couldn't share that information with these? Surely these are straightforward, uh, you know, straightforward considerations in terms of supply and oxygen and those types of things. So I'm wondering what type of consideration would prevent you. And I, and I certainly hope that that wouldn't be the case, that the minutes will be provided. But what what considerations are ongoing as to why those couldn't be shared with committee? Uh, general data protection issues, Chair, as to who may be named, what may be indicated in it in regards to that. I haven't had a chance to even have a look to those, those minutes to see what they do contain or what areas they cover. Um, so it's, it's not... A, it's, I, I want to make sure that I, I'm covered in regards to anything that I release uh, from this department also is of the standard and also meets the requirements that is necessary uh, for the release of documents. Okay, thank you. And this is finally, finally from me. And I appreciate that you, you did, <coughs> indicate that, I did, did indicate to Jonathan that you were providing a political answer in relation to the protocol. However, one of the other things that Kathy Harrison shared with us last week was that a request had been made for a further extension of the grace period to deal with medicines to 2023 and um, can you give us any update that hadn't been responded to as of as of our last engagement with kathy has that been responded to and are you concerned in relation to to uh, that time period I, I am chair looking and i think as i indicated in my answer to jonathan as well uh when grace periods were initially indicated the one for medicines and medical devices was the longest uh, because they, they indicated and we knew the difficulties that they were going to be addressed. So look, any extension to a grace period would be welcome because it would allow us to put firmer foundations into the supplies that's needed. And that also takes into consideration uh, what political uh, movements or discussions or discussions or agreements can be made between the UK government and the EU specifically in regards to the supply of medicines to Northern Ireland. Okay. Okay, thank you, Minister, and thank you, Chief Medical Officer, for uh, engaging with the committee this morning. I uh, want to wish you all the very, very best in what continues to be a very difficult and uh, a very, a very challenging times. And we understand that that uh, that the successes need to be built upon. While while I think it's fair that the population uh, hopes for the best, and we all certainly do that, we also have to um, structurally and system systemically prepare for the worst. And I think that's. That's uh, something that we will want to continue to engage on with yourselves. But appreciate your attendance this morning and wish you all the very best. Uh, more for now. And thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Okay, members, I'm going to take a short break there. Just uh, maybe if we could return at quarter past at 11.15, please. We'll resume our meeting then. So could you take us out of broadcasting, please, Claire? That's us all for now, Chair. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. So we will now resume with uh, our item six on our agenda is the departmental briefing on rebuilding of services. Uh, I refer you there, members, to the departmental paper, which is at tab 6.1 of the pack. The minister's recent statement on rebuilding services is at tab 6.2. And the trusts, rebuilding plans, and other papers are at tabs 6.3 to 6.10. So I can advise members and officials are here today to brief the committee. So I would now like to welcome Mr. Peter Jacobson, who is Director, Rebuilding Surge Planning within the Department of Health. Are you able to hear us okay, Peter? I can hear loud and clear, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're hearing you clear there, Peter. Thank you. And. Uh, we're also, Peter is joined by Miss Lisa McWilliams, who's Director of Performance Management in the Health and Social Care Board. Uh, Lisa, are you able to hear us okay? I am indeed, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we're hearing you there fine. Thank so you. thank you very much. And just, uh, just then, in terms of just to reiterate that if possible, if people can use headsets, that improves the sound quality. If I can ask all members and panel uh, presenting to to make sure you're on mute when you're not 
speaking that also helps with the sound. So I just want to welcome you both this morning to our committee and um, I look forward to engaging with you on this, this important, as do committee members, on this important area of work. So uh, can I ask which of you are going, are you going to do a presentation and then question and answer or how do you want to deal with that? Uh, yes, Chair, I'll do uh, some opening remarks and uh, hand over to Lisa to say a bit more in detail. I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, sure, I'll, I'll make a start. So, yeah, so thank you, ahead. Chair, thank you, and members for the welcome yeah. and for the opportunity to brief you this morning. Um, yes, as, as, mem as uh, the Chair said, you should receive a, a briefing paper and hope you have the opportunity to consider this in advance of the session. Um, I would like to draw out some of those uh, key points from that briefing note and then hand over to Lisa who will say a bit more about the role of the Health and Social Care Board in particular in relation to the trust rebuilding plans. So what is rebuilding? Well, uh, as you will be aware, before the pandemic, the department handled on the way a significant program of transformation informed by Delivering Together and the Bengoa report. And the principles set out in the Delivering Together very much also underpins the rebuilding, rebuilding agenda. So it follows that uh, reforming and improving our health and social care services is at the very heart of rebuilding. Of course, the context has changed and we are now emerging from a year of dealing with COVID-19, uh, in addition to the many challenges that we faced pre-pandemic. Uh, and the pandemic will be with us for at least to some extent for years to come. And that is why the rebuilding mission statement emphasizes the prevailing COVID-19 context in fact, I, I tend to think of rebuilding and search management as two sides of the same coin. Uh, the more resources that you have to devote to manage, managing a COVID-19 surge, the less of it is available for, for other activity, such as tackling elective waiting lists. Yeah, just a second, Peter. It's it's a wee bit hard to hear you. If you can increase the volume a little and maybe uh, slow it down. It's, we are hearing you, but try, it's just okay. a wee bit hard to I'll, yeah. I'll try and uh, get a bit closer and I'll try and speak a bit slower, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's also important that we, that we rebuild in the context of the lessons learned throughout the pandemic. And I know that this is at the, the forefront of policy leads uh, across the system. So one way to look at rebuilding is to break it down into trust rebuild plans and then the rebuilding work streams. So the, the trust rebuild plans are all about increasing capacity and activity in the COVID-19 context. So the latest set of plans cover on the period April to June 2021 were published on 13th of April. And due to the severe impact of the pandemic, no rebuild plans were published uh, for October to December 2020 and January to March 2021. The latest rebuild plans are underpinned by five principles. Amongst which is the need for, for staff to decompress and take leave as necessary. I think it's also important to recognize that actually many of our health and social care staff wish for nothing more than just return to their normal duties uh, to deliver the care that they are expertly trained to do. And the publication of the latest plans is a, it's a step in that direction. So the five principles that are underpinning the, the latest plans are uh, number one, that we de-escalate um, ICU as a region, informed by demand modeling and staffing availability. Number two is that staff are afforded an opportunity to take annual leave before assuming their normal duties. The third principle is that the elective care rebuild must reflect the regional prioritization to ensure that most uh, those in most clinical lead, uh, regardless of their place of residence, are prioritized. And the fourth principle is that all trusts should seek to develop green pathways and schedule theatre list two to three weeks in advance. And the aim will be to, uh, for any given staffing availability, to maximize theatre throughput. And the fifth principle is that the uh, <clears throat> Belfast City Hospital in Nightingale should be prioritized for de-escalation to increase uh, regional complex surgery uh, capacity on that site as quickly as possible. Uh, and they would then initially focus on development of green pathways in this, on the site, and then as the number of COVID-19 patients reduce, uh, BCH will become a green site serving the region. And um, as you probably will be aware, that has actually already happened. So that site is now free of uh, COVID patients in ICU. And um, as I mentioned at the outset, Lisa will say a bit more about the context for the latest trust plans shortly. Um, in terms of the rebuilt work streams, as you can see from the briefing paper, they are very diverse, um, but also must emphasize they're not set in stone. You can, of course, add to them and take away over time. Uh, and the other important point to make, obviously, that's not the totality of the activity in the department. <clears throat> There's lots of activity 
uh, and policy development going on in, in all areas of the department and, and across the system that are maybe not directly reflected in any of those rebuild work streams. Um, but you know, people can still take papers to the rebuild management board if they, if they feel is necessary. So <clears throat> what generally happens is the policy leads will bring proposals to the rebuild management board. Uh, and I'll say a bit, a bit more about its role in a, in a minute. Uh, but typically where there's a reasonable approach, and this is actually really important, uh, and I would say this is a key trend across the rebuilding program, that we increasingly think about services in a reasonable way. And I know it's something that the minister has emphasized on a, on a number of occasions. Okay, so what's the, what's the role of the Rebuilding Management Board? Well, its role is to oversee, challenge, and ultimately endorse or otherwise uh, policy proposals then brought forward by policy leads. The board provides a forum for, for frank and open discussion on key policy proposals before they go to the minister. So the rebuild management board also considers, also considers the, uh, the trust rebuilding plans uh, brought forward by each trust. So given that the board includes uh, all of the most senior officials from the trusts, the health and social care board, the PHA, BSO and the department, it provides an efficient way to ensure quick collective senior management of, uh, of, of proposals. So the board also have access to external expert advice as required. Importantly, the board does not have the ultimate decision-making power. That, of course, rests with the minister, who continues to take all major policy decisions. Uh, and for this reason, the, the rebuilt management board reports directly to the minister. The, the board operates under two pillars. The first is to manage COVID-19 surges, and the second is focused on rebuilding. I think it's fair to say that the, the primary focus in January and February of this year was to manage the, the severe COVID-19 surge. But with the rollout, uh, successful rollout of the vaccine and the stabilizing numbers in terms of infections and hospital admissions, the focus is now increasingly shifting towards rebuilding. And I'm sure that's, that's not really a surprise to anyone. So another issue that's been flagged since the, 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 the board was established is the representation and input from external stakeholders. I think at this point, at this point it's important to emphasize that the proposal table at the Rebuild Management Board should have been developed subject to all relevant user engagement, stakeholder involvement, and public consultation is appropriate. And it remains the responsibility of policy leads to ensure that this happens, which has always been the case uh, even before this was established. So much work has actually been advanced over the last year to provide support to policy leads. Uh, and the briefing paper highlights the role of the PCC in this. I would like to take this opportunity to thank PCC for their important role in supporting the rebuilding program. Um, Co-production, engagement, and consultation is, is as important now as it was uh, prior to the pandemic. So members will probably be aware that the uh, Transformation Advisory Board has also been reconstituted, and that provides a form for strategic input from a range of external stakeholders, including representatives from the trade unions, volunteer and community sector, service user, and business. So, Chair, thank you again for the opportunity to brief the committee. Um, I would like to hand over to Lisa now, and she'll say a few words about the specific role of the Health and Social Care Board, and also uh, the context for the latest trust plans. And after that, of course, we will we will do our best to answer any any questions that uh, you, Chair, or members may have. So, Lisa, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm going to briefly provide uh, more detail to the committee on the rebuilding plans that the trusts have produced uh, for the period April to June, and we reference those going forward as phase five plans. Uh, so in line with the approach for previous rebuilds, uh, trusts have provided separate data annexes that really set out uh, the volume of activity to be delivered across a key range of performance indicators spanning acute, uh, allied health professionals, mental health, community and children's services. Uh, as with the trust rebuild plans, uh, activity projections are guided by the five principles Peter's outlined. So in setting out projections uh, for activity, the five uh, uh, provider trusts were asked to ensure that they were sufficiently challenging, realistic and showed a gradual increase as the quarter progresses. There was an expectation that plans would reflect the lessons that have been learnt uh, from both the previous activity projections about their planning, but also about the COVID experience. So we expect to see the learning of the and reflection of the innovations uh, from COVID, for example, digital technology to see patients virtually rather than face to face. 
So the Health and Social Care board, Board's role in this process was twofold. Uh, first, need to consider the narrative in the plans against the five principles, uh, but secondly, to provide Rebuilding Management Board with an assessment as to whether the activity projections were realistic and challenging based on the indicated planning assumptions. It's important to acknowledge that the activity projections were developed in mid-March and were submitted on the 19th of March. So at that time, we had 177 COVID patients in hospital beds and 20 confirmed or suspect COVID patients in ICU. If we look at yesterday, uh, the COVID bed occupancy level has reduced by 100 uh, and the COVID ICU occupancy has halved to 10. So in a short period of time, there's been quite a change, uh, although non-COVID ICU occupancy remains largely unchanged throughout this time. While the published data annexes uh, include projections for three months, um, there is a caveat that the projections for May and June are indicative at this stage. Uh, and we are currently working with trusts to review the activity in April to date. Um, this is, as we want to be clear, with regards to the high degree of uncertainty we're facing, we want to be sure that as it becomes clear over coming months that trusts if they can do more, they should do more. Uh, so there will be an adjustment to the May and June activity projections. In developing projections, trust had to indicate the impact of both Easter uh, and the two bank holidays in May uh, and reflecting that important principle of facilitating leave and staff decompression. In addition, a number of constraints continue to be applied or applicable, uh, albeit to lesser extent. So the social distancing guidelines and the impact on physical space, vacancies and infrastructures. Um, so trust chief executives gave Rebuild Managing Board uh, their assurance as accountable officers on the 31st of March. The plans that their trust teams had developed were robust, realistic and challenging based on their current understanding of capacity and constraints. Uh, the plans were subsequently accepted and have been published uh, with that important caveat of the review. As with previous rebuild plans, the boards will monitor actual activities delivered against projections and will provide uh, rebuilding management board with an assessment of progress, will highlight variants um, and raise issues for discussion. Um, and as I said, the board will be working with the trusts to do that adjustment for the May and, just, May and June activity. Um, and again, that will be reviewed at Rebuilding Management Board in early May. Uh, so, Chair and Committee, uh, thanks again for the opportunity this morning. Uh, and as Peter said, we'd be more than happy to take any questions uh, from yourself, Chair and members. OK, thank you, Lisa and Peter. Um, and I suppose, Lisa, just a quick one, um, just uh, picking up on, on one of the final things you said there about monitoring activities and that the activities will be monitored. Will the outcomes be monitored and what measurements are in place to what? What are you measuring against in terms of the outcomes? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I suppose our monitoring returns in first and foremost are uh, our an activity monitoring return. So we are matching uh, projections against deliverables. Now there is an entire expectation that trust will continue to capture patient outcomes um, and will continue the engagement that they have to capture patient feedback. Um, and then all the, the clinical teams engage in clinical audit. Um, so we will expect to see the normal um, outcome uh, measures associated with clinical audit uh, and service improvement plans associated with those. Okay, um, yeah, because I think it's important that, that at some point in time we move towards that outcomes because clearly what gets measured gets done. So we have to have the, the baselines and, and seeing progress in that sense because, you know, just, just demonstrating activity doesn't obviously Im demonstrate a positive outcome. Or, we can't achieve everything overnight, but it's important we have a trajectory. Okay, so going back then to the to the sort of the main the main briefing, I think I have to say like there's nothing within the five principles that I would disagree with, nor nor do I think that anyone think they're all important in terms of de-escalating ICU in terms of that very important issue of giving staff a break. And I think it's a useful point to just once again acknowledge the extremely. Uh, dedicated and professional staff that we have out there who have taken us thus 
far through this pandemic at a huge cost to themselves. Um, and I will declare my own interest as, as previously working as a social worker and my wife being a nurse. And um, I, I, I understand it from that perspective in the sense that the effort here and the, the sacrifice of staff and the pressure placed on them has been absolutely unique. And I think hopefully we will never see that again, but we certainly need to acknowledge the staff. So that's taken for granted. Elective care, and we all understand the pressures that people out there, the suffering that's going on out in our communities around the lack of access to elective care. So no one argues with that. The green pathways, I think we have we have met as a committee and we have uh, with, with the surgeons and with various health professionals, and that appears to be a practical and a pragmatic approach. And in terms of de-escalating the, the Nightingale, those are all good. So I suppose what, what I want to do then is focus on some of the things that aren't in the, in the document um, and that aren't included. And the first one that I want to focus on is health inequalities. Because we, we cannot do rebuild and then look at what we do about inequalities. Inequalities in health absolutely cannot wait. So therefore, every action must be seen as an opportunity to impact upon health inequalities. And I am disappointed that there's not more reference in the principles, but even throughout the documents. And the only reference in a quick search that I've been able to find in a, in a very large pack uh, to inequalities is the Western Trust, in fairness to them, have, have uh, a line in that they will continue to work in partnership with neighborhood renewal areas in the planning coordination of health programs that reduce health inequalities. But every effort and everything that we do in terms of rebuilding should be addressing it. So why is health inequalities not hardwired in from the very, very foundation of everything that we do that the rebuild process now is taking inequalities into account and how the rebuild might impact positively on that issue? Maybe I'll say a few words first here on that. So obviously, the, I mean, each plan um, have the equity of access to services at its heart. So that's, in, that's embedded in each of the, the trust plans. Okay, so that's as a principle. So the, the five principles, I think it's important to say that's on top of what we what we would normally have included. So those five principles are specific to these plans that I've just published. Okay, so the, so the, the trust will have- just, 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 let me, just let me interrupt Peter to say- yeah, Go ahead. Treating, treating everyone exactly the same doesn't necessarily address inequalities. No, we have I, to I focus on- I accept, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we all broadly accept that, that that's an, but it doesn't address the core inequalities that are sometimes systemic, sometimes transgenerational, but are, are causing huge concern in our communities and huge burden on our health service. Yeah, no, no, I accept that, Chair, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I suppose the, I mean, so, so for example, in, in terms of the, uh, the elective care, there's now the, the regional prioritization. So, so regardless of where you live, um, you, you get access to, to, to surgery based on clinical need, obviously is, a, is an important step in that direction. Um, and I don't know, Lisa, do you want to say a bit more about the, how that works and functions? Well, I suppose the key uh, the key premise for the regional prioritisation oversight is that we are targeting to our uh, resource to our most uh, clinically urgent, regardless of postcode. Uh, but, but Chair, if I might pick up your point with regards to health inequality uh, more generally, um, and it does tie back to outcomes um, as your your opening comment. Um, it, it, there, there is a substantial uh, amount of work associated with the migration of the Health and Social Care Board into the Department of Health as part of the uh, changes um, that have been previously approved about future models of planning, uh, and they are absolutely underpinned by population need and addressing inequality. Um, so I think there is a substantial amount of work in that space, uh, but you're right in terms of uh, it, it's not necessarily verbalised or, or contained and specifically mentioned in the trust rebuild plans. Um, so you know, that you know, we would have to acknowledge that. Um, so, but there is a separate large scale piece of work with our public health agency and departmental colleagues to actually ensure that we plan services that are fit for population need and uh, benefit uh, and drive population outcomes uh, and you'll see that focus more towards uh, prevention uh, rather than uh, treating um, uh, and I think that's one of your core uh, premises of the health committee um, so uh, if that's some way of assurance uh, and I'm sure colleagues would be happy to provide a, a further briefing on that uh, to the committee. Yeah. I think a lot to that Lisa as well that 
sorry, Chair, I, I'll maybe add to that that the work streams as well, obviously, are based on population health needs assessments. Um, if there's a, a service change or service review on the way in a particular area, you know, the starting point is always the population health needs. Um, so, so I think the same principle applies in that in that sense. But you, uh, yeah, except it's not it's not explicitly written down here. Yeah. And, and, and could, could you commit, therefore, that future iterations of this policy will put inequalities front and centre on the face of the documents that require the trusts and the department to, 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 to put it very, very central there? Yeah, absolutely. I can't see any issue with that at all, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And that sort of leads me on to my next point then is around the resources required to implement the rebuilding plan. And there are no resource indications here on the document. So again, um, that leaves it a bit difficult to, to kind of uh, isolate what's a priority. It does, the, does the resourcing exist? Is the department having to go and seek additional resources? Or um, it, it leaves it very hard to track and monitor. So can you, can you outline or explain why there is no resource allocation to these measures? So I think, there's, there's, as I said, there's two aspects to the rebuilding. There's the trust plans and there's the, the work streams. So the trust plans is obviously activity that they say they can deliver. So that's resourced within their baseline. Um, I think that's the assumption we have to make, right? Um, then there's the work streams, and that's a different matter, Chair. Um, so obviously, when um, you know a, a new review of evidence emergency care is one, cancer, uh, mental health, all those areas, um, if, if proposals come forward to have significant uh, pound tags on them, um we don't necessarily have the resources to do that straight away but that's you know that's just the situation um and we would need to seek further funding or reprioritize um or, or, or suppose implement um as as funding becomes available so that's that's how we have to work it that's the same as as any other policy or in the department yeah yeah but do, but do you understand or do you accept peter that it's very difficult for us to uh analyze or scrutinize what what particular uh, priority is being given to each of the methods in terms of a notional, you know, a notional allocation of budget? So there's no information yeah. here at all. Do you think no. that's? Do you think so? Yeah. So as each as each work stream will uh, publish proposals, there will be contacts with that. So you remember there was the cancer plan that was published back in the the autumn, which had some pounds signs against it. So that's, that would be the expectation, uh, expectation that uh, as plans uh, or, or strategies or frameworks are published, that it'll have the, the pound signs in them at that point, and obviously an indication of whether that's uh, affordable or not. I think the point, oh. the, I think the issue is, Chair, that they, they all move at different speeds. So some of these things are, I mean, there's the cancer has, we have published something already, others uh, are still uh, at the development stage. So we can only really put those pound signs against things as, as they have been developed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. And then that does lead me on nicely, actually, to my next issue, which is in terms of the red. Now, first of all, I want to say I very much welcome the focus on elective cure, and that's hugely important. But I am curious as to why um, red flag cancer and other uh, procedures for life-threatening uh, other life-threatening conditions aren't explicitly referenced in the rebuilding document in terms of getting those back on, given their importance. Well, I suppose cancer is included as, as part of the, the each of the plans. Um, there's a section on cancer, general section on cancer, and there's also um, obviously each plan, each trust will detail what they're going to do in terms of cancer. That's there, and the activity projections include those uh, metrics you, you spoke about, Chair. So I think it is included. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what more you had expected to see on that, maybe. Um, well, well, I suppose in terms of urgency, so you've identified five areas, including elective care, as being an area of for okay, so worthy of worthy of mentioning five in the five. Okay. Yeah, principles. Yeah. So I'm just wondering why the re why getting those very important surgeries and procedures back on is not one of the principles. Well, I think that's uh, yeah, maybe maybe it should have been written specifically, but that that's absolutely it. It's absolutely a priority. Of course, it is. Um, so. I accept that, yeah, it is. And, and do you have do you have a timeline when all when all trust will have their red flag surgeries back up and running? I don't think they have, Lisa. You might know better than I do. 
I, I think, Chair, um, with regards to the red flag uh, surgeries, um, we do in the trust plans for the next three months see an increase in outpatient activity uh, month on month. So I think it starts at a thousand inpatient uh, in April and it goes up to 1300. So they will, as a priority, be our red flag and our complex benign uh, in the first instance. Um, there is still a uh, workforce issue uh, and there still is um, some diagnostic uh, challenges, particularly in the cancer uh, associated with scopes uh, that mean that we have more patients on the diagnostic pathway still being worked up for appropriate treatment. Uh, and I think the trust individual plans do give an indication of where they expect uh, their 31 day and 62 day performance to be. Um, and, and it would be fair to say the 62 day performance, which is data referral to treatment, uh, I think regionally by the end of three months it is nowhere near what we would want it to be. I think it's forecast at 47%. Uh, so that is an indication that we are still, uh, even at the end of three months, going to be some way away from having the full capacity that we maybe had before COVID, uh, which actually um, wasn't sufficient uh, for many of our targets in elective as well as cancer. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a concern. Okay, um, listen, I will go to other members there now. Um, uh, so at this point in time, I have indications from Carol McKillen, Pam Cameron, Jerry Carroll, Paula Bradshaw, and Arlia Flynn. So we'll start there with Carol. Go ahead, Carol, please. Thank you, Leader or Peter and Lisa, for your um, presentation. Um, and just looking. I just want to pick up on the point where you left off in terms of diagnostics, including endoscopy um, and other screening, um, particularly for certainly, you know, concerns around aggressive cancers. Um, I seen even in the Belfast plan, um, while it refers to, you know, cancer treatment and elective care, um, I would like to see a bit more, particularly, you know, uh, in terms of what are known as aggressive cancers. Like, for example, someone I was working with recently got a diagnosis two years ago at the end of January and they were deceased by the beginning of April and the, um, the, the diagnosis wasn't picked up quick enough. Um, now, so it's really in relation to that. My big concern again is around workforce planning um, and it seems like and this is a department issue I appreciate but it seems that there's just a constant reliance on the private healthcare sector to meet the gaps so I would like to know what is happening uh, with recruitment of the gaps there's over 3,000 nurses that we know of there are many consultants that are needed as well what is done about the recruitment of the gaps currently and also what is done about the retention of staff as well um, because that is critical in terms of going forward for any recovery. Um, so, Chair, I'll just leave it at that and then just depend on what the responses are, I'll come back in. Thank you, Carl. Maybe I'll, I'll pick yeah. up on the, the workforce. Um, I can't probably speak in too much detail because it's really workforce policy colleagues that leads on that. But I know that I know there's a, there's an action plan has been developed for I think from from uh, January till June 2022, uh, which is always pick up that. But I think Carol, the resourcing is absolutely critical here, uh, funding, because you cannot you cannot train and recruit staff if you haven't got the funding to pay for it. That's 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 one of the biggest constraints we have, and recurrent funding at that. But you're obviously aware of the the extra 900 uh, nurses that have been trained. Uh, which is obviously a step in the right direction, but as you say, it's, it's not enough. Um, and it's not enough if you're going to make significant inroads into into the elective care waiting list and so on. So, so more needs to be done there. Uh, but I, th I think that um, funding is, is continuing to be a, a significant strain. Um, I think that's all really I, ca I can say on the issue. Um, hopefully that goes some way to answering your question. Yeah. 
if I could pick up on your point with regards to the aggressive cancer, if that's helpful. Um, I, I think we have um, particular types of cancer that we know um, are harder to diagnose and unfortunately can be much more aggressive and have a very short window. So the pancreatic cancer would be a prime example of that. Uh, but there are also aggressive tumours in every um, cancer type as well. Um, and the key in all of that is the drive for early detection. Um, but associated with that is letting you know people know what signs and symptoms to look out for um, and ensuring that our diagnostic systems can be responsive enough uh, for those referrals to actually try and capture those. Um, if it's of, of assurance below each of the levels, the high level of what the trusts say their total performance will be, um, I am cited on each of the tumour specific um, challenges and also what their projections are. Uh, and we have monthly cancer performance meetings with the trusts uh, to look at that very detail. So there is a level of information, uh, not in the public plans, but there is oversight and an acknowledgement um, that those aggressive um, cancers and they're likely to be the uh, cancers that we also try multi-modality so they're probably captured in our 2a our uh, highest priority patients at the moment uh, once they're diagnosed uh, so hopefully that's some assurance of of more oversight in that space so chair I, I do think uh, even going forward it would be helpful because we recently spoke too many um, of the professionals, including surgeons, and they're absolutely up for, you know, doing what they can. Um, but again, we keep coming back to the workforce issue. And indeed, the fact that the staff safety legislation didn't proceed is disappointing as well, because given the impact that COVID has had on all our health and social care staff and their need for arrest, but also a need for a resumption of services. And again, while I appreciate money is a big issue, we still see a reliance on the private health sector and that uh, th that needs to be broken. And I haven't seen any convincing plans coming from the department about what and how that's going to happen. I appreciate there's a January to June um, recovery plan, but again, um, it's it's not detailed enough. You know, and saying that we need more funding, we we appreciate that. But what can we do in the here and now? And the fact that the staff saving legislation didn't go through is disappointing. So I would ask, even if the information can be provided to the committee, um, what are we going to do, particularly around you know if elective surgery is to increase? What about our intensivists? Um, are they expected to travel as well? Um, because the surgeons were very clear that they can only do the surgery, but their whole team have, have a holistic approach in terms of the treatment that they provide. So if we get that, and my last point, Chair, is I did ask the Minister, and he agreed um, through the Chair at the end to provide additional information on long COVID. I haven't seen it feature now. It may, it may be part of uh, prehabilitation and rehabilitation, but certainly the impact of long COVID on uh, respiratory illnesses around the need for physiotherapy and indeed mental health and other services is something that I think we need to plan for the future. So they're, they're my questions, Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you, Peter and Lisa. Thank you. Maybe a couple of comments just on that, just to the end, that there's, suppose there's things we can do. So I think Minister Sigland, he will he will publish an elective, elective uh, framework uh, in the near future. Uh, so hopefully set out some of those, uh, some of that detail. But the other thing I suppose is to make the best use of, of the resources we do have. So for example, the day case, uh, electric care center in Lagan Valley, uh, the fact that surgeons have traveled out on a pilot basis to the to, to deliver surgery. So we, we can try and do what we can, obviously to make best use of the existing resources. But you know, I think everybody accepts that we need to, need to invest more in our workforce. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, under long COVID, I think that I think one of the issues is that it, it's it's quite early as yet. I don't think we fully understand what long COVID is. We we have some data and evidence, but I think there's you know we're still we're still learning and understanding what it is. And and I suppose until you you understand what it is, um, it's difficult to really um, produce a, a, a you know a treatment package for it. Uh, and an intervention package. But I think work is on the way in the in the board at the moment to do that. 
um, and they're working away and trying to, to, to develop something that, that, can, that can assist people. Um, and, and I suppose trying to determine where it sits best in primary or, or secondary care or community. Okay, thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Carol. Going then to Pam. Cameron, go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Peter and Lisa, for your attendance at committee. And, and, and thank you for the, uh, the detail provided in the, in the trust rebuilding plans and appreciate that much work has, has gone into devising those plans. Um, I have a, a couple of questions for you um, in terms of, um, uh, I would like to know what's happening um, to support the return of paediatric surgery. And also wanted to know if, if there's flexibility built in within these plans to allow uh, sharing of diagnostic capacity including including scanning so if we could start with those and then have some more thank you uh, peter if you're, if you're happy if i seem to lose you just right at the end there pam i'm not sure if, if lisa or peter caught the end of your question yeah i think so okay okay yeah uh, thank peter, you. Oh, sorry, I want to share, Peter, if you don't mind, if I pick up the diagnostics in particular, um, we do have a diagnostic equalisation plan where we are sharing um, access to CT, MRI, um, uh, and we have benefited from some uh, COVID equipment uh, with regards to mobile x-rays uh, and ultrasound equipment. Uh, so we have a plan that actually does already do that, you know, moves patients uh, and has slots based on need so that diagnostic plan has been in operation throughout covid uh, and we are building and enhancing and any new scanners that are coming online uh, the expectation is that they slot into that as well so diagnostics and diagnostics is one of our areas where we have actually got a re reducing waiting list uh, because of the focus that we've put across the board in diagnostics so you'll see that in the diagnostic performance um, your question with regards to return to paediatric surgery, we have been um, working across the region. So a, a lot of paediatric specialist surgery uh, would, would take place only in the sick children's hospital, but other sites would do uh, uh, paediatric surgery. So the Ulster have been doing some paediatric surgery cases for uh, based on clinical need, regardless of um, place of location for the, that, that child. Um, and the plans do have um, in each of the trusts as they're switching on their theater capacity we are looking at pediatrics as well as adults we're not losing sight of the pediatrics so we do expect that the trust to be taking due cognizant of clinical need regardless of whether it's a child or an adult uh, so we are making progress albeit it's slow and maybe add to that pam on, on the pediatrics so there is a pediatric work stream which has begun work okay. on the, on the pam, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah. I think so I might be frozen on my screen. No, I can see her. I'm still here. Her head. She's still there. She's still there. Oh, great. Right. There is a pediatric strategy, of course, this, which is uh, implemented by the pediatric network. So we've asked that network to develop a rebuild plan for, for pediatrics, uh, which is, um, frankly, just recently begun with the input of the Royal College of, of Pediatrics and Child Health as well. Health as well. So that work is on the way a wider sort of pediatric and children's health services okay so that 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 should hopefully come forward with some proposals over the next uh, couple of months that's great thank you both for that um my next one was on the um the northern trust's activity plan which is suggesting a target of 40 percent of face-to-face -face referrals for those um engaged by child and adolescent mental health services so i wanted to ask what what will happen with the rest of the children and young people um the the, the 60 percent um how, how are their needs being being addressed um i i suspect peter and i uh, maybe we'll have to speak with mental health colleagues but i do know from uh recent discussions with the northern trust uh, and we in the board have a new director of social care uh brendan whittle so we did have a very brief conversation about the model of service delivery uh, and whether there was a, a required change to service delivery and um, to bring all trusts online uh, but in that conversation uh, it, it led to uh, an you know an equalization 
So do we need support of the other trusts in order to um, to bring that performance up and particularly in the cohort that may be required the step three interventions. Uh, so that conversation is taking place directly across trusts, but our social care colleagues on the board uh, are, are heavily involved in that. Uh, and it is part of the departmental focus on, on CAMS. Uh, but I would be happy to ask for further information in that space uh, uh, and submit it in written form if that's helpful. That would be helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and my final question is in around, um, could you tell us uh, what support the executive can provide the uh, provided support trust in, their, in fulfilling these planned um, performances? And has the minister made any asks as yet of the finance minister in relation to it? Well, I think you, you probably hit the nail in the head, Pam, around any asks, there'll be about funding, won't it? Um, so I think that's where the executive could, they could step, you know, support us in terms of giving us the funding we need to, to develop and, and implement these plans. So as I said before, the trust, we, the trust plans themselves are a little bit in the baseline of what we have at the moment. The big ticket items in terms of additional funding will come out of the work streams. So it'll be around, you know, the cancer rebuild, about elective care plan, which all, I mean, elective care will need, I mean, I think, Lisa, you mentioned before, I think, as well, 750 to a billion over 10 years, you know, and I don't think that's changed. You know, so th that 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 long-term funding commitment is what's needed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah, were you looking back in there, Pam? No? No. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going then to Jerry Carroll, Paula Bradshaw next, and Orla, Orla Flynn after that. So go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Lisa and Peter. Um, first question is around the principle two, um, around uh, staff getting annual leave, much needed, obviously, annual leave. Um, do, do we have a sense of when that will be uh, taken up? Has there been anybody been able to um, avail of that uh, in the current period? Um, and when it is when is it expected uh, for the majority of staff to uh, have uh, access to um, greater or, or use of their annual leave? That's my first question. So, uh, will you take that one, Lisa, or me? I'll, I'll take it. Sorry. Uh, uh, the the trust plans and the narrative with regards to the scaling up of activity, particularly in April, uh, would indicate that quite a lot of leave was planned and expected to be taken uh, over Easter and in April. And then the days on either side of the two bank holidays, I think, are, are the trust planning assumptions so that the teams will get a break um, and then it's clear that when you look at June you're into your normal holiday planning um, so I think there is an expectation that a lot of staff had an opportunity in April and will continue in May uh, to get the leave uh, and then there are a specific HR um, framework um, allowances for the carry forward of leave um, so that people weren't disadvantaged but also that the services don't then suddenly have such a reduction in resource. Um, so as I say, the plans do indicate in the trust narrative that that was expected in April and May largely. Okay, uh, and do we have any idea then in June uh, what percentage of staff may take their annual leave? I mean, they're all deserving of it, but uh, I want to get a sense of is the, is the, the board and the trusts kind of uh, cognizant of how many people will be taking leave in, in May or June? Yeah, I, I think each um, each individual trust and, and service manager uh, in their job planning of, of sessions. So we do plan forward six weeks. So we will already know the workforce available for six weeks from today. And that's normal business planning. Um, so there will be a strong expectation and there's some flex normally in summer months, um, although we may not have the same demand um, for people having time off. Um, you know, uh, preschool breaks or, or or school holidays because of uh, some of our restrictions on travel, um, but but normal business planning would have that indication in terms of leave and workforce availability. Okay, um, I don't know if Peter was looking in there on that one. Sorry. No, you okay, Lisa. Lisa okay. covered that one expertly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just just an, another uh, question there, um, Chair and, and Peter and Lisa, around the board, the re uh, rebuild and management board. A um, couple of points on that. Um, yeah. I mean, there. Yeah, I think you may have a delay there, Chair, on your end. I think just your your reference. Um, 
the uh, yeah the the fact that proposals are submitted to the RMB uh, and a quality screened. Um, I mean, the question around whether that's a screen for children's rights uh, as well. Uh, I think the language in the report says uh, there should be um, you know, quality screening uh, or impacts carried out, but that seems to be um, quite timid. It should be more robust. Um, so maybe a comment uh, on that. Um, and then just two final points on that. Um, uh, on the the. the the management board, um, happy to be corrected, but from my reading of it, um, there's not a single workers representative on it. Um, there's not a voice of anybody impacted by equality issues on it, and it seems to be all um, senior management or deputy senior management, whatever the correct terminology for that is. So that's that obviously not to suggest those people are uh, unimportant. They have a level of expertise and, 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 and all the rest of it. But you know, there's a certain element of groupthink that comes with that. Uh, it's a cohort of people coming together. Um, so I think that's quite uh, quite concerning. I think it's been raised uh, previously. And finally, just on services. Um, I mean, obviously, um, people want to see services back as soon as possible in terms of dealing with waiting lists, in terms of dealing with all the health issues that we have. But I mean, uh, will all these services resume as they were, aside from maybe a greater uh, virtual uh, input? Because there's a concern out there that there may be uh, a plans a, either formulated uh, or unformulated to um, allow for some services to not return. Um, so I think people, myself and other members and, and the public generally, want a strong assur assurance that you know no services will be um, reduced, ran down, uh, or you know done away with in this period so I would like an assurance on that as well thank you okay Jerry I'll, I'll pick I think pick up most of those um in terms of the quality screening issues um as, as I said in the in, in my introduction I mean it is for the policy leads to make sure that that's whatever is appropriate for each policy area is, is carried forward and taken forward um and it'll probably differ from policy area to policy area exactly what's required and the depth of it um, but it, that has always been the case, and that hasn't changed with the the rebuild management board set up at all. That is still the case. Um, we still have those responsibilities, um, so that that is that that is still going ahead as as it should do. Um, and obviously, any anything that goes to the minister will always have to have to be equally screened. Any major politicians that hasn't changed and, and won't change. On the uh, just on the composition of the rebuild management board. So yes, you're right. It is all senior officials from the from the various um, uh, from the department and from the various ALBs. Um, I suppose the input from from others, uh, including uh, the union side and uh, voluntary community sector and so on, it comes at the development stage. So when when proposals are developed, um, they are co-produced uh, and there's engagement with uh, the, the right stakeholders. And as I said, PCC plays an important role in terms of identifying the right stakeholders. Um, there's also the Transformation Advisory Board, which has been reconstituted, which has TUS uh, in, uh, representation on that. And obviously, any major proposals that come forward will, will be taken through that group for, for comment. So I think there are mechanisms to try and address that. Um, I suppose thinking about it in terms of before we had, when we didn't have the Rebuild Mansion Board uh, a year ago, what would happen was that typically a proposal would be developed in exactly that way, and it would be taken through perhaps through the, the line manager structure up to the to the firm second the minister. So I suppose the, the rebuild management board has has in a way replaced that. Uh, that as opposed to so it's more of a collective decision making and bringing in the, the trusts and the ALBs into that decision making um, to make sure we get that perspective. So that's that's really the difference. Um, in terms of services. I don't think anybody foresees any services uh, being taken away. Um, certainly, I mean, we all our discussions about in, in improving and increasing services, and like, as we talked about before, based on the population need. So, whatever the population needs, that's what we intend to deliver. Lisa, anything you want to add? Um, I, I suppose, and Jerry, apologies if I didn't pick you up correctly, because um, I think that the we have through COVID moved to a lot of virtual activity, um, and uh, that virtual activity is appropriate in lots of cases, 
but we are increasingly seeing in the trust plans the need to move back to face to face for a, a number of specialties. So we've talked previously about mental health and dementia, uh, but also respiratory and gynae are an example where face to face assessments uh, are much more beneficial for cohorts than virtual. Uh, that said, the virtual um, telephone follow up, the virtual reviews um, actually are really beneficial both for the service because of the capacity, but also it prevent it doesn't require uh, you know, um, individuals to travel physically to a, a site for something that might take 30 seconds. Um, so there is an element of capturing what is good um, and ensuring we build on that, that actually drives not only efficiency and productivity, but actually benefits the patients and gives the same outcomes, uh, but also having the flexibility to actually switch on the face-to-face -face for those that actually um, clinical teams actually physically need to see uh, and in some instances, you know, um, you know, put hands on. Um, so there is that mix uh, and we are cognizant of that. Okay, thank, um, you. Okay, thank you. So moving, moving on then to Paula Bradshaw, go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and good morning, panel. Um, the first question I'm going to ask is in relation to information in the Belfast Trust's plan there was around renal um, donor trans um, plant program and they said there's going to be a phased restoration of this program pending theatre capacity. So could you please outline who has responsibility for deciding on theatre capacity in terms of allocating the time and what way are you dealing with the backlog in those live transport plants um, uh, on a regional basis? Thank you. Uh Peter, if you're happy, I'll, I, I'll respond to that. Uh, so individual trusts uh, are responsible for, whilst we have regional prioritization oversight groups that's looking at the priority to patients, each individual trust has their strategic uh, prioritization group, they call it slightly different names, that actually determines uh, which cases, um, and particularly in Belfast where they're, they're doing the specialist surgery, so it'll be Belfast patients, they have a, a structure where they risk stratify um, and with their medical director and the clinical leads agree the allocation uh, of theatres um, on a priority basis. Um, I'm not close enough, I'm afraid, to the uh, donor transplant, uh, the live donor uh, transplant programme and where that sits. Um, I know a lot of those cases aren't necessarily a priority to patients. Uh, some are, um, so there has been some dialogue in that space. But the trusts, uh, particularly Belfast Trust, who have the specialist surgery and they are the facility and only facility that can treat those patients, they have a mechanism where they have to be assured that they're allocating theatres based on highest clinical priority. Thank you. Just to pick up on the phrase there, the risk stratification, I think I got it right. Um, where there's a delay in that transplant um, situation, um, you, you know that, that that's very costly in terms of you know, dialysis and it costs, I think, 650000 in a 20 year um, lifespan, et cetera. I'm just wondering, when they're looking at those urgent clinical needs, is long term impact on the public purse, for example, is that taken into consideration? Or at this stage, is it just about the patient's prognosis as opposed to long term costs to the health trust? Uh, well, the prognosis would be for uh, at the forefront, but I do know in uh, renal in particular, because of the pressures and dialysis and the long term implications, that's absolutely taking into account, um, you know, because on paper, a, a patient might be a priority for, but when you take into the account of the fact that they may have a window for treatment, then they would be a priority three. So I know that the dialysis, particularly for renal, is absolutely taken into account, as well as prognosis, not necessarily because of money, but because of patient experience and outcome. No, thank you. And just to continue on, I think Peter touched on it a bit off the back of what Pam said there around paediatric surgery. And I suppose this is part of that wider programme of work that you, you mentioned there. Um, uh, and the fact that uh, in terms of the waiting, um, getting on the, the um, theatre list for paediatric um, surgery, is there any longer term plan to actually have like a really enhanced children's hospital where all the services would be really on one site, for example, like the SWA or something, where you would just have theatre just for children's um, surgery, for example? Thank you. Not that I'm aware of, Paula. Um, not, not that I'm aware of at the moment, no. Um, 
it doesn't mean it, it, it'll never happen or it'll be considered, but it's, I'm not aware of any thinking in that, in that sense at the moment. Okay, no problem. Thank you. I'm just moving on then. Uh, I submitted a question to the Health Minister recently looking for an update on waiting lists for endometriosis. Um, so the Southeastern and the Belfast Health Trust, they both record um, the waiting list under that um, title, whereas um, the Northern and the Western don't record, um, but they would record that under just the, the gynae list, so to speak. I'm not sure what the Southern Trust do because they didn't reply um, to the request for the information. So how can the Regional Management Board assess clinical prioritisation when trusts, not just in endometriosis, but I'm sure across a range of disciplines of medicine, are actually recording um, the information differently? And is, is this process also around trying to um, assimilate or have a, a common way in which things are recorded? Otherwise, I think people in some of those areas could be missed. Peter, if I take that, if you don't mind, um, okay. you're absolutely right. So, so endometriosis is one example of a subspecialty within a specialty. Um, uh, and quite often when we're looking at information, you'll see gynae, but you'll not see detail below. Um, so there is an acknowledged um, uh, difference in how trust services are developed for the treatment of endometriosis, which has impacted on how they've recorded it. Uh, two trusts have a specialist approach uh, accredited by an external body that requires reporting in a certain way, uh, and others don't. Now, there has been a drive to uh, regionalise and standardise that, and, and Encompass will help that. Um, the uh, tying it back to how we are cited in terms of prioritization I, I suppose the regional prioritization oversight group is looking at individual procedures um uh, by way of um being able to determine a, a category um, and at the moment we're only really looking at so urgent hasn't stopped so they're the emergencies coming in through blue light uh, and priority to i think i previously said are those patients that need treated within seven or 30 days endometriosis and many other specialties will have procedures that are probably p3 p4 and um, so we are currently rolling out a process of actually expanding that categorization to individual procedures uh, and clinical risk uh, and in doing that that actually removes that ambiguity um, and it doesn't really matter that they code it under gynae because we will see the procedure coding and the clinical urgency of that patient uh, so we're about to introduce an electronic system uh, that will ultimately feed encompass in the next couple of weeks and we're going to expand from p2s to other specialties because you're right otherwise we don't know and we don't know what's in our waiting lists so we are cognizant of that and taking the appropriate steps to try and address that in a timely manner okay thank you but just just to go on a, a little bit further into this I, in terms of one of the responses to the um questions i put into the minister around endometriosis i was advised that the belfast trust has 0.8 of a um, specialist endometriosis consultant none of the other trusts have one and none of the trusts have a specialist endometriosis surgeon. So I, I not to undermine those people here at the regional management board or those people who are feeding the information, but if you don't have a specialist endo consultant, how are you assessing whether or not the, 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 it's a clinically urgent procedure or not, if people are not sitting around the table who actually know? And so the, the wider point and back to the Health and Social Care Board is, how did we get to a situation where the trusts could have such an array of vacancies in such an important area that so impact upon women's lives through through the um, through their lifetime until they actually get the surgery. Um, the so and apologies because I'm not close to the commissioning of gynae services, uh, but uh, but I do know that the board has a team that was working on endometriosis and also on the mesh issues, um, and um, mesh and, and endometriosis are. Um, are high in the priority for being clear what does a good service look like and what do we currently have spread across the region that actually might you know uh, through collective working actually deliver a service that is better uh, so i think the two trusts that had started moving towards an accredited center were in that space in terms of having that multidisciplinary team uh, and you're right because it's not just a gynae surgeon with endometriosis you will want to involve colorectal and neurology surgeons uh, because of the nature of the disease so those multidisciplinary conversations can take place um 
uh, and they do take place and they would inform uh, a categorization for a patient but the there is more work required in the uh, subspecialties within gynae in terms of making sure that the services are fit for patient need uh, but it does come down to workforce and resourcing thank you chair okay thank you paula um so then I have the following members uh, in this order, Orlea Flynn, Alan Chambers, and then Jonathan Buckley. So go ahead, Orlea, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and maybe, Lisa, just to follow quickly on from Paula's last point, um, I was going to ask a question around in the document. Um, I didn't notice any reference to um, the, the, the reopening um, or the phase plans for the regional mesh clinic. Um, which which falls under the Belfast Trust and under their gynae section. Um, you know, there, there's different clinics that's referenced, but there's there's no mention at all of, of the mesh clinic. Um, I, I do have questions into the minister also on those reopening, but can you maybe explain, or would you have any idea why that's that's not contained within that document, given that it's such a significant um, regional service? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, but I would be happy to speak with colleagues to get that information for you. That's that's great, Lisa. Thanks very much. And then um, either for for Lisa or or Peter. So within within the document, it had mentioned that um, the the rebuilding management board is scheduled to meet weekly. Um, although it only meets if there are substantive agenda items. So could maybe someone elaborate then on how often this group does meet and what determines a uh, su substan substantive agenda item because I'm just thinking obviously with the context that we're in um, and, and the, the, the pressure and the urgency to try and rebuild the services and to get them reopened again. Is there not a need that that, that board um, should be meeting on a weekly basis? Absolutely. I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah, I mean, and, and, it, and actually um, it has been meeting very regularly over the last month or so, uh, but through January and February, I think it might have been only once or twice. But that was simply because, I mean, you know, we had we had over 800 COVID patients in, in hospital, and uh, you know, it was all about search management. And we actually set up a separate group, um, a COVID-19 command group, which was a slightly different group, but that met daily at times to manage the search. And that's where the focus was. And I think there was one or two management board meetings um, to get a few updates and a few of the work streams, but really all the focus was just that. So I would expect from now on that it will meet, if not weekly, then every second week. Um, of course, it'll only meet if, I mean, so it relies on papers coming forward from the work streams or from the trust. Uh, so there's no point meeting if, they are, if, if nothing is come forward for decision or discussion. So we'll try and table it. But yes, I think it, it'll meet very regularly over the, over the coming months. Absolutely. No, thanks for that, Peter. And, and if you don't mind, it would be, I think it would be useful if the committee could maybe be kept up to date on, you know, how regular those, those meetings are yeah. taking place. And I understand that it is determined by the work of the work streams. But you know, this is people's lives and health that we're talking about. So, absolutely accept with the COVID, and you know, when 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 patients were so sick as a result of coronavirus. Um, but now we need to keep that urgency and that momentum going for all the patients that are sick for for other reasons. Yeah. So, any updates that would yeah, be much absolutely. Do you, do you point out to pay? I nearly forgot this. We actually publish um a, a summary of each meeting on our website, so you okay. you'll you'll actually see the dates that it, it's met. To date, uh, it's on the website, uh, and we we'll continue to to publish that. That's right, um, Peter. Thank thank you. I'll have a wee look at that, um, yeah. and then just finally from myself. Um, so on the makeup of the rebuilding management board, um, I know that back in December, the allied health professionals, um, it was uh, Jenny King, um, was told by the minister that she would be sitting on the new health and social care management board, and I just noticed whenever I was looking down the list of um. The makeup of the rebuilding board that the allied health professionals um, aren't represented on that so i'm just wondering the reason for that and then also the thing that really concerns me is i mean mental health has been referenced numerous times um by, by both of yourselves and you can even tell by reading within the document you know the the, the demand has increased the capacity wasn't there pre-covid so it's definitely not there now but the demand is increasing um further still and I'm just wondering, it has been flagged up by the professional bodies um, the, around the psychology professional bodies that, that they don't have a voice um, or a position on those management boards. And given the context of the surge in mental health concerns 
um, I'm just wondering, would there be scope to look at giving the voice, um, you know, to the Royal College of um, Psychology for that purpose? Um, I just think given, you know, given the, the situation that we're in, I understand the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, I understand that everyone has responsibility to give that voice to mental health. But I think that now, if there's ever been a right time to, to have a focus on that board, um, it's now given the increased and in, in demand. So maybe just your, your opinions on that. Yeah, so so Jenny Jenny Keane actually does, uh, has a standing invitation to the Rebuild Management Board. So she's not a formal member uh, and, and, and probably it reflects that she's not She's not formally, I suppose, signing things off, but she's there to give advice, and she actually attends most of the meetings now, um, and she has a standing invitation. So, and, and certainly, if there's any issues come forward around allied like professionals, we expect Jenny to be there to provide advice and guidance, and and and, and you know, and and provide her advice to the board in terms of uh, the, any decisions they take around endorsing or not of a book. So she does indeed attend. And just on that point, Peter, would there be any scope to look at, um, you know, bringing bringing the the um, getting that psychology input onto the the board? Well, I, th I think um, I think that's really I think that should be in the development of proposals. So it's around when there's the mental health strategy and, and mental health issues are being are being developed. I think that's where their influence should be. So they're actually embedded in terms of developing the proposals as opposed to signing off on them. And that's the same for any other stakeholders we we engage with. It's through the development of proposals that the real influence is and where they can influence proposals and that's how we expect them to be involved in in those in, in those development of, of proposals as opposed to sitting on the board no well that, that that's fair enough and i suppose just to say because it has come up at different conferences around mental health it, it has come up time and time again so we um in our own party submission to the minister we've actually put that into our consultation response that that um that those professional bodies need to have that that voice yeah. Um, on that, on that, um, that board. But thanks very much for your answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Orlea. And going then to Alan Chambers. Go ahead, Alan, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and, uh, thank you for the input so far. Um, we about Alan, uh, Alan, Alan, Alan. I Alan, just, just sorry for interrupting you, Alan. Uh, just to make you aware, we are hearing you. There's a wee bit of interference. I think it's enough. It's good enough. But if you can just if you can just keep it very slow and as clear as you can, there's some interference coming through on your line, but I think we'll be able to manage it. So just to make you aware of that, Alan. Thank you. Um, we have been talking about a, a process of one-year budgeting. Uh, and even in that, it's a day the budgets that are coming through necessarily uh, have the necessary been coming through in particularly in the fashion. So surely um, Alan, Alan, I'm sorry, I'm going to, Alan, Alan, I'm going to have to cut across you again. Actually, it, it's not possible to follow it. We've lost key bits of you there. So what, what I'll do is uh, I'll maybe go to I'll go to Jonathan and come back to you. I'll give you a couple of minutes there to try to resolve that issue, Alan. I'll go to Jonathan and come back to you. Go ahead, Jonathan, please. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah. We're hearing you, Jonathan. Yeah, we're hearing you, Jonathan. Yeah. Apologies. I have I've had terrible connection issues this day, and I actually can't hear a lot of members. Um, so apologies for that, because I have missed large parts of members' questions and large parts of the presentation. Um, but listen, in, in relation to the presentation, thank you very much for because I've read, obviously read what, what you've su submitted, and it is quite detailed, and there's a lot of good work that's going on in this regard. Uh, and I think it's it's rightly now where the focus should be on the rebuilding. So could you, could you answer me this question? Are the provisions of the cancer recovery plan uh, reflected in the trust's proposals for April through June? If not, will this hold up the progress of the plan when announced? So I think, Jonathan, I'll take that one. So um, I think the, the short answer is probably no, uh, because the plan hasn't been developed yet or published yet. So it's only really when that's that's signed off uh, that trust can start to get, get into account in their plan. So if it's announced in the next few weeks, I would expect that the the next set of three month plans from from July onwards will indeed take that into account. So I think that probably answers your second question. I don't think it'll hold it up because it'll it'll, it'll start to be implemented and embedded within the, the service delivery as and when it's announced. Okay, and. Uh... 
one of the main concerns that I and indeed other members have highlighted throughout COVID-19 and indeed it was brought to light actually in the um, debate on Tuesday as well was the inequalities that were, were, were f- featuring right across Northern Ireland in terms of patient experiences across the different trusts. So with that in mind, does the department or the minister believe that it is ex- acceptable that different trusts have different targets for cancer referrals, wait times and treatment under these plans? And does he and, and indeed the department recognise that this goes against the, the very principle of equity and fairness for patients living in, in different communities? Because I think this is something that has really came to light, not only in terms of the trust provision, but also indeed uh, the experiences that patients have had across the GP services in Northern Ireland throughout COVID-19. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I, I think we had a discussion at the beginning about that, and I absolutely agree and accept that. Um, I think, I think, yes, important to to address the equality across the piece um, and to plan and deliver services based on population health needs, regardless of where 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 people live. So, yes, Jonathan, I, I would agree with that. He said, "Would you uh, have you anything to add on on that particular point around this?" <laughs> Yes, and I suppose Jonathan, you're right to draw out the. Uh, I suppose it's not the it, the trusts are indicating what their expected performance against the target is going to be in their plans, and you're right to draw out the variance, uh, which is obvious in the cancer. And uh, you know, if I can pick up on the 14 day breast by way of example, um, you know there is a disparity um, amongst you. Know, we have a number of trusts who are um, who are really struggling. Um, um, and another trust who is sitting at 100%. So that trust has actually agreed to allocate specific lists uh, to equalise the weights uh, of, of the other trusts. So um, th- that there is an active approach um, to move patients, uh, even in the assessment, let alone the, the treatment, um, because it's not acceptable to have that postcode lottery. And I think the minister has been very clear in, in his statements that, that that practice is not acceptable and we all uh, need to work to equalising uh, access uh, and, and timely access. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. And there, there is great concern regarding our level of waiting times and waiting lists at, at present. And that that goes across the board. Just, just this week, I had a, a constituent who is five years of age in need, dire need of a tonsillectomy. Um, is, is warned he can't, can't eat solid foods. Uh, there's a risk of choking. He's now not allowed to attend school in case of risk of choking, but yet no sign of, of an operation that could help transform that young man's life and also give him the ability even to go to school due to waiting lists uh, as would have been precipitated by COVID-19 and the, the scale down of some services. So I really would press the need that we need to get uh, operational as soon as possible. Now, I don't think there, I don't think there is an excuse now. I think we really need to work collectively to get these services reopened and allow patients to, to receive the care that they desperately need. So thank you. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So I'm going to now try to go back to Alan Chambers, and I think Alan had an issue with his headset there. So Alan, could we try to get you in again for your question, please? <laughs> I'm still not hearing you, Alan. Go ahead again, please. <laughs> no, we're, we're not we're not we're not hearing you alan alan i wonder could you could you uh, maybe if you submit your question via the clerk to to peter and lisa um maybe they can come back in that in that fashion we're just you're obviously struggling today with with the sound issue so apologies for that alan but um if you put the question in i'm sure lisa and peter will will address it via that channel back to the committee yes Thank very you. happy okay. to I, okay thank you thank you very much um I suppose just just and I, I do acknowledge Peter the uh, the the importance that you stressed in terms of co-production and co-design, um, and I suppose that has been a, com- a concern for the committee as well. Um, can you can you can you tell us how often 
the, the tab met in relation to producing this document, just to give us an idea of how dynamic that, that process is, because I know the tab has been a bit on and off, and it's really, it's a very important element of co-production and co-design, but I think also engagement out beyond the tab and out into communities and, and with sectors is important as well. But can you give us some idea of how many times the tab would have met to, to input into the current uh, rebuilding plans? So the trust plans, I don't know if the tab wouldn't have had input into the trust plans. No, the department, the department element. No, I don't think they, would, they wouldn't have. So it was, it was done so quickly. Involved. It was done so quickly, Chair, that, that there was no time um, to, to engage with tab on, the, on that particular bit. No. You see, uh, that, that's, a bit, that's a bit regrettable, Peter, and I have to say, I think that's something that needs to be given very urgent attention because we we seen recently with the depart where the minister had said that he had in relation to the cancer plan had spoke with the HSC and the trusts. Now that's not co-production in the sense that those are essential elements of delivering any plan that you would have to that you would have to talk with. You have today mentioned BSO and mentioned PCC and all of that, all very welcome. But proper co-production and co-design has to go out beyond that. And I think. You know, we are, we are, as a committee, consulting with people virtually and online and working in, in very pressured circumstances. I know the APGs are now doing similar. And while there are difficulties with online communication, there can be some advantages in terms of spreading it out to wider groups of people. I have attended APGs recently where there were 80, 80 to 100 people at times involved, people from all over Fermanagh, parts of constituency that couldn't have made it otherwise, people with disability or access problems. So I think we need to get very quickly back into meaningful co-production to capture the value of it in the first instance, as well as involving people. But the people with it who, are, who are experts by experience, I think can contribute and we can save ourselves from going down blind alleys by, by, by speaking with them. So I just would, I just would worry about that, 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 um, that too much of this. So we're also talking at a time when we're, we're, we're looking at the HSC dissolution bill and that's one of the key elements that you have mentioned as, as one of the key elements of who you're consulting with within the narrow parameters of what you're doing at present. So again, that's going back into the department. So there is a kind of a concern now that things are being retracted back in and that broad engagement is, is seriously being hampered at the present time. So I think I can, your thoughts on that, Peter? I think I can reassure you a bit, Chair, on that, um, because I mean, a lot of the department uh, input to this um, if you look at any of the rebuild plans, you'll see a section which covers the departments and it's about critical care, cancer, regional waiting lists, orthopedic hubs, day case, no more silos, vaccination program, mental health, health social care, all of those areas uh, and all the, all the initiatives that come forward from those have been co-produced and has been widespread engagement on all those areas. So I think, so, so while it's maybe not on the, on the specific text that I hear, but that's just a summary of all of the massive amount of work that's on, on sitting underneath all that. Okay, so cancer, obviously, cancer strategies co-produced, mental health strategies co-produced, and all those plans will be co-produced. So I think I can give some assurance in that, in, in, in that sense, Chair. And I think that's where the and actually I think that's where the that's where the co-production should sit. It's on development of all those detailed plans, um, and the electric care frame and so on. I think that's where that's where it sits best. Yeah. Could, you, could you provide us? Could you provide us then with with the information relating to that? So that's welcome news. Um, could you give us? Could you give us a look under the bonnet in the sense of giving us an example of how that co-production is being delivered and how it's feeding into the planning? Because I am, I am, I am yeah. happy to hear that there is, but, but there's no there's no tangible sense of how that's happening or the extent of it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm happy. I can pick a few of these areas out, and I can uh, I can put provide some examples back in terms of how that's done. And I think, Chair, it's done. The thing is, it's done no, differently. No, sorry, Peter. I'm not, sorry, I'm not looking at examples. I'm looking at extent. I'm looking, I'm looking yeah. you know, I'm looking at activity, if you like. So I don't want, yeah, I don't want no, to see absolutely. good examples. And I, I appreciate those exist. I want to see the extent of it. Yeah, no, happy to do that. But what I mean is I can set out on the, on the for example, I know uh, on, the, on the cancer strategy, there's extensive engagement, so on. So we could set out how that's working. No more silos, urgent emergency care review. We can set out exactly how that's how that's how that's being done. Happy to do that. I suppose no information exists. I don't have yeah, it to and, hand and, here. And particular, yeah, and in particular, the no more the no more silos element of it. I take it relate to no more silos within trusts or within health. I'm keen to know what co-production is taking place outside of health. 
with with service users, patient voices, yes, um, representative groups. That's what I intend to do. That's what I intend to provide you okay. that information. Happy to do that. Okay, thank thank you. Um, Thank you both Lisa and Peter for your attendance here today and for your engagement with, with committee members there and for your commitment to uh, to ensure that inequalities is is a central and an upfront element of, of planning moving forward and also some of the information that you have uh, committed to setting on to the committee, I appreciate that as well. But thank you very much for your for your input today. I think that's been a very useful briefing session. I have to say, I think I think members will appreciate that uh, and, and the, the level of detail. And we'll take a look at the additional information as and when that arrives. But good luck to both of you in the future in in your very important work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, so. Any brief comments on that? I'm going to before we go into our SRs, I'll take a very quick break. But are there any brief co any comments or anything members wish to wish to input there? I think there is a commitment to providing us with different pieces of information. But do members have any thoughts or anything else in terms of follow up on this? No. Okay. Well, listen. We can. We can. Uh, we can. It clearly will be an issue that we will be continuing to keep under under a. Uh, our ob observation and we'll be engaging with moving forward. So I'm going to take a short break there. Could we come back for 12.45? So just a seven minute, a seven minute break there, please members. Thank you. That's us live now, Chair. Okay, thank you, members. So we will now resume with, uh, we have now the next five items on our agenda, our SRs relating to coronavirus restrictions. There are departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on the provisions of these regulations and to take questions from members. Can I refer members to the papers at tab 7 to 11 of your pack, which include a clerk's memo there at tab 7.1. So I would now like to welcome Ms. Liz Redmond, who is Director of Population Health. Uh, good afternoon, Liz. Are you able to hear us okay? Hear you. Can you yeah, hear me? thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, we're hearing you there. We're hearing you there, Liz. You're you're very welcome. And I believe you're joined by Marion McKeever, Liz. Uh, so, Marion, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Yes, there, Marion. Yeah. Yeah, and Marion, just for members' information, what's your role within the department? I'm staff officer in the health protection branch. Okay, thank you very much. So listen, you're both very welcome this afternoon to our meeting. Um, thanks for coming along and members I'm sure are keen to hear your briefing on the SRs and to then engage in any questions that members might have. So do you want to go ahead Liz please and give us your briefing? We'd love to hear what you have to say. Sure, thank you uh, and thank you very much for in inviting us to attend today's meeting. Um, today we're considering five statutory rules can I just check that you can hear me? Not everyone can hear me on this laptop very clearly. Yeah. So it's it's a little faint. We are hearing, well, I'm certainly hearing you, but it's a little faint. So as, as loud and as slow as possible, headset if possible, but outside of that, uh, as loud and as slow as you can manage, Liz, please. Sure, I'll do that. Um, so today we're considering five statutory rules. Um, SR 2021 number 71 and SR 2021 number... 91, which are amendments number six and number seven for 2021 to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions number two regulations, Northern Ireland. The third will be SR 2021 number 93, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and its first amendment, SR 2021 number 97, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021 Amendment Regulations. And finally, SR 2021 number 96, the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. So I'll begin by briefly outlining the context and content of each of these SRs, um, and, and as always, happy to um, subsequently take questions regarding them. 
The context for all of the regulations we're discussing today was the eighth review of the number two regulations, which took place on the 16th of March and a subsequent consideration by the executive on the 1st of April. So taking you back to the eighth review in mid-March, at that time, there'd been a steady decline in the rolling average of new daily positive COVID cases as a consequence of the restrictions that had been put in place uh, on the 26th of December 2020. There was a modest decline in the daily average of new positive cases during the first week of March. Uh, there was an average of 173 cases per day um, over those seven days. And that was reflected in the R for cases being in the range of 0.75 to 0.95 on Tuesday the 9th of March. There was a slight increase of about 7% in the average daily new cases the following week up to 185 cases a day. That has risen the, the RT for cases to 0.9 to 1.1 range. The RT for hospital admissions was estimated um, as 0.55 to 0.75 and for ICU occupancy it was 0.45 to 0.95 at the time of that eighth review. However, the ICU position did remain a concern. The standard funded provision is 72 ICU beds and any ICU beds above that level require the deployment of staff from elsewhere. At the 10th of March, the total number of critically ill patients stood at 91, so it was above that um, funded provision. Uh, of those, 29 were COVID positive, and that was a reduction from the peak in January of 74, which was very good. And then by the following week, the 15th of March, uh, the COVID-19 ICU bed occupancy had reduced to 22, which was the lowest since the 12th of October, when it was also 22. Uh, I suppose the, the committee should note that on the 16th of October, uh, we were very close to entering into a, a second lockdown. So we do need to be mindful of how quickly the situation can change, albeit that we were in a very different place at the time of the eighth review in mid-March than we had been five months previously um, with the rollout of the vaccination program and the disease was on a declining trend. So the positive impact of the vaccination program continued to be observed with the reduction in the proportion of cases aged over 60 and a reduction in the proportion of hospital admissions aged over 80. So at its meeting on the 16th of March, the executive considered the evidence I've just summarised and concluded that overall the restrictions and requirements remained necessary and proportionate as a response to the epidemic. However, it was also agreed that a number of careful easements could be made after, uh, under a, a gradual and measured process. The Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor's advice at the time was that the risk of spread of infection is much lower outdoors than indoors, and this is reflected in the relaxations that were agreed at that eighth review. So if I turn now to each of the SRs in turn, so we'll start with SR 2021 number 71, which is amendment number six of 2021 to the number two regulations. And that was made on the 24th of March. There were two commencement dates for those regulations. So if we start with the first commencement date, which is the 25th of March, and this brought in the following changes. It amended uh, to the 15th of April, the date by which the regulations must be next formally reviewed. And that was to align with the dates in the pathway. Um, it also made a technical amendment to omit Regulation 15 of the Principal Regulations to remove the expiry date of the 31st of March. And it removed a restriction on professional sporting leagues or competitions that had not commenced prior to the 18th of December 2020. Now, I just wanted to explain that last one a little bit further. Um, so prior to this Sixth Amendment, Elite sports were restricted to professional leagues or competitions that had commenced uh, prior to the 18th of December. Um, there were a number of new competitions coming up, such as the uh, Football World Cup qualifiers, which was scheduled to uh, begin at the end of March. 
And so the Sixth Amendment uh, relaxed the restrictions to allow these competitions to proceed. Um, given the mitigations in place for elite athletes and the reduction in the number of cases since December, the Chief Medical Officer and the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor were content to support these relaxations. And th this allowed the Irish League teams to begin training and it en enabled two World Cup qualifier matches to take place on the 25th and March, and it allowed a uh, UEFA friendly between Northern Ireland and the USA on the 28th of March. So if I uh, turn to the second commencement date um, of SR 71, and that was the 1st of April, when the following amendments were brought into operation. The list of permissible contactless click and collect services was extended to include garden centres and plant nurseries with requirements that payments are completed at the time of ordering online by phone, text or post, no cash transactions permitted and customers not permitted to enter the premises. Up to six people from two households were permitted to meet outdoors in a private dwelling from the 1st of April and 10 people from two households were permitted to exercise together outdoors, which enabled people from two households to go walking in a group. If we turn to the next SR, that's SR 2021 number 91, amendment number seven for 2021 to the number two regulations. This was made on the 31st of March, 2021 and commenced on the 1st of April. This R made two additional changes to meet the policy objectives agreed by the executive. And these were to enable those 10 people from no more than two households to gather for the purpose of any outdoor sporting event as defined in the regulation. So that included any exercise or training, expanding on what we had in amendment number six. And it permitted indoor toilet facilities within sports or exercise facilities to um, open for persons participating in an outdoor sporting event to use those toilet facilities. So the third SR that we're discussing today um, is SR 2021 number 93, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. This is a new set of principal regulations which commenced on the 9th of April. This is a consolidation of all the previous amendments to SR 2020 number 150 made in July 2020 and revoked and replaced the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions number two regulations Northern Ireland 2020. For shorthand, we'll be referring to these new principal regulations as the 2021 regulations as distinct from the number two regulations, which they replace. The rationale behind this um, was to improve understanding and accessibility of the regulations as they'd been amended so many times since July last year. And this would allow us a clear platform from which to make further relaxations and amendments to the restrictions over the next number of months. There are no policy changes within this uh, new consolidation version of the regulations. I think that's very important just to stress there. There were some face coverings provisions in relation to places of worship and close contact services that had been included within the number two regulations during previous months. And we did not include those in the consolidation, the, the new 2021 regulations. Instead, we made SR 2021 number 96, which amended the health protection coronavirus wearing of face coverings regulations, Northern Ireland, to include those existing face coverings provisions. Again, they were not new policy ranges at all. Um, so SR 2021 number 96, which was the first amendment to the wearing of face coverings regulations for 2021, were made on the 8th of April and commenced on the 9th of April at the same time as the 2021 regulations. This SR requires members of the public to wear face coverings whilst inside a church or other premises where beliefs are practiced and requires those providing or receiving close contact services to wear a face covering. And while the wording has changed slightly, I should emphasize again that these do not reflect any change in policy. 
Um, in addition, the face covering regulations now provide operators of a passenger transport vehicle and their employees and agents with powers to enforce the legislation as it relates to operating a passenger transport vehicle. So the operation, uh, operator of a passenger transport vehicle can direct a person using a transport service to wear a face covering direct that person to disembark from a vehicle or leave the passenger transport service premises or direct a person not to enter or to leave a passenger transport service. So again, this is not a policy change. Um, the operators of passenger transport services had been designated as a relevant person with identical powers under the number two restrictions regulations. These powers are now instead within the wearing of face coverings regulations. So the fifth and final SR we're discussing today is SR 2021 number 97, which is the first amendment to the newly consolidated health protection coronavirus restrictions regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. This SR was made at 7.30 p.m. on the 10th of April and commenced on the 12th of April. The policy associated with this amendment had been agreed at the eighth formal review of the number two regulations on the 16th of March. Um, at its meeting on the 1st of April, the executive ratified the 16th of March proposals and considered an additional paper tabled by the executive office using the executive officer's process for assessing relaxations where they are deemed to be urgent or compelling reasons to consider changes outside the four week review process. Um, a number of additional proposals for relaxations on the 12th of April were submitted and following executive uh, decisions to support those proposals were included in this amendment. So these regulations commenced on the 12th of April and the following are enabled through them. Enable click and collect services to be provided for all non-essential retailers. Permit the opening of outdoor retail, including motor vehicle dealerships, car washes, garden centers, and plant nurseries. Allow for visitors to view the facilities of venues used for weddings or civil partnerships accompanied by one staff member. They remove the general restrictions on movements, that's regulation 14, which required people to stay at home or at the place where they live normally, unless they have a reasonable excuse. They permit uh, an outdoor sporting event for up to 15 persons, which is for the purposes of training organized by a club, individual or individuals affiliated in each case to a relevant sporting body or to an organization that regulates and provides advice and guidance to members on matters relating to sport and physical activities. It uh, removes the 25 person limits on persons attending funerals, marriages or civil partnership ceremonies. It permits 10 people from up to uh, a maximum of two households to meet outside a private dwelling outside at a private dwelling and correct that. So I hope that provides you with a summary of the context in which these uh, amendments were made and an outline of the content. This does bring you right up to date um, with the current regulatory position um, ahead of the changes that were agreed by the executive at the first review of the 2021 regulations on the 15th of April, which will um, take effect tomorrow. So again, just finally to remind members that the scope of these regulations is far reaching across the responsibilities of many executive departments. So if I'm unable to provide an answer, I will certainly seek clarification from colleagues subsequent to this meeting. That was all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And, uh, and thank you. I, think, I have to say, I think the, the, the provision of context and the, uh, what, what's going on at a given time is very, very useful in terms of setting it in context for the committee. So thank you for that, and I do appreciate it. I suppose the first couple of questions from me are probably around process more than, than specific to the amendments. And um, I guess it is, it is, I suppose, to some degree welcome that, that there is a kind of a consolidation or whatever being taken of, of, of them. I raised this with the Minister, I also raised it with Elaine last week, but in light of where, that we're moving forward and we're hopefully making progress, 
what steps are being taken to revert to the more normal procedures in terms of bringing forward an SL1 to the committee, allowing the committee to have a look at that stage and to provide what could often be valuable uh, in terms of our advice role, providing a representation from, from people who are seeing cases on the ground. So can you tell us what, what steps are being taken to move us back into that more normal process of evaluation and scrutiny? Yeah, uh, certainly I can tell you that we would all rather be operating in that way. Um, and it's the circumstances that we're in uh, that are causing that to still be quite a challenge. Um, what we are finding is, um, as has been explained, I know and you're aware, as the Department of Health, we ultimately make the regulations, but we're very dependent on a lot of very complex conversations and interactions um, with other departments to get the policy tied down. It's very, very difficult to do that with enough time to be able to consult in the normal way with you. And as I say, we, we all regret that. We would rather we weren't in that situation. We often find we're, we're refining this, this right to the, to the very last moment. And I know this is something that um, there's people in our department considering how this could be could be addressed. Um, and I, I, I can't give you any more information on that. I can only say to you that we find the pace of this extremely challenging, um, you know, and that, that's the reality we've been living with now for more than a year. Okay. Okay. Um... And, and, you know, I, I, I do understand and I acknowledge those pressures, I have to say, but is there a sense that, that we're starting to move beyond those pressures to a more a more normal way of bringing these forward? So we're not approving things that have been already in place, or as you said, they're coming into place tomorrow. So, you know, is there is there a kind of a, is there is there some uh, light at the end of that tunnel in terms of the process? Well, I think that the, the light that we're all looking for is probably the bigger light, which is is coming out of this into the summer where we've actually moved into a world where most things are operating again. Um, I think we're now in a stage of quite a rapid change. So I, I'd, I'd have to say I think it will be quite challenging in the very near future to get to that place where we'd all like to be, which you're expressing. Um, because we are entering, well, we're right in the middle now of a very rapid adjustment, which is happening. Um, you can see it in what we've talked about today. Um, and we, you'll know from what's been announced last week, um, what we're going to move towards this Friday and the following Friday. So um, I, I think um, the, the, the way out of this is to get to a, a more settled position regarding where we are with restrictions and the need for restrictions um but we we keep this in mind and we we actually have internal conversations about well could we do it this time and it and it's actually as i've said already extremely challenging for us the pressures and the time pressures and the complexity of this are very challenging um they're quite unprecedented in our careers i have to say so um but I would bear in mind what you're saying, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, entering into the summer, if we can get things open and moving again, we might have more breathing space to be able to revert to some more normal processes with you, which is certainly what we'd prefer, I think. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you, Liz. So I'm going to go to members then. I'm going to go first of all to Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, and then I have Paula Bradshaw and Jerry Carroll, and then Jonathan Buckley. So go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Liz, for that um, presentation. As ever, I think we'll all be glad to see the back of these restrictions. We're all looking forward to getting back to some form of, of normality. Um, in terms of the um, the enforcement approach by the PSNI, um, will we likely see a, a change in that, given that, um, that the stay-at-home message has been revoked? So, for instance, beauty spots, are we likely to see a change in how um, that is enforced by, by police? And I also want to ask you if you've had any discussions with the PSNI to ensure the fair interpretation of of the uh, regulations as they change. Well, I'll, I'll take the, the second one first because the, the PSNI are part of our cross-departmental liaison, which we um, have on a 
regular basis. There's a weekly meeting that's chaired by the executive office. Um, they're engaged, we're engaged, and we've also have very direct one-to-one -one contact with them, particularly during the drafting stages. So that that I'm confident that that, that relationship is there um, in the context of how the regulations are presented. Um, for instance, we worked very closely with them around the whole timing of the consolidation because we knew they had enforcement notices that needed to be updated with text. It was very important that we were very close to them over that. Um, in terms of a change um, in their approach, well, the, the law has fundamentally changed, as you said yourself. Um, in terms of how they approach, I think if there's some particular interest that you have in that then it might be worth us getting that contact directly with you because i i mean we're not in touch with the day-to-day -day operations of the psni and how they uh, how they enforce against these regulations I, I wouldn't feel confident to be able to answer your question in full and i'm just wondering if there's some specific concerns you have um, either you could express them and I could take them away and try and get those addressed or, or we could have some more direct con contact set up. Thanks, Liz. I think it's more it's more in a generic um, way, I suppose. And I suppose, you know, people are wanting to stay within the law and to n not risk fines and whatnot. So I think it's it's important for people to know what, what it's OK to do now, uh, you know, and I think you know, just even the, the weather's brightening up and it's nice and people will want to travel a bit further and, you know, go to beauty spots or maybe to the beach or whatever. And they, and they don't want to do that under a cloud of, you know, am I going to be challenged or turned away? Or uh, I, I think that's important just so people have the confidence that, that it, what they want to do is OK now. Sure. I think maybe that links as much as anything to the communication strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're moving more towards... So we we uh, removed the legal barrier to, to leaving home, if you like. Um, but we, we've moved towards a stay local message because we re and really it's all about the staying safe again. And if there's a crowd, avoid it. You know, I mean, that's the sort of message we really need to get across. And particularly if the crowd is indoors, avoid it. But, um, you know, any crowds are best avoided still at this point. And I think we, we have had discussions with, TEO about that and just generally across the, the departments um, because the communications piece is important and we're in a time flux so we're having to refresh it now. Yeah, so, I, appreciate, yeah. I appreciate that and, and I suppose you know the, the crowds um, in, in outdoor spaces it's a difficult one because people haven't had anywhere else to go you know they've had no gyms uh, they weren't allowed to to go and do their sport uh, so people were kind of being forced to the same generic areas to do to do all of that and to try and do it safely so it is very difficult to actually find, especially if you're trying to stay local as well yeah. it, it's difficult actually to, to to find somewhere to take the dogs or get out with the kids on the bike or whatever that actually you're not meeting a lot of other people so I think that one is quite difficult but hopefully as we go forward and, and start to reopen um, that actually will spread people out and, and make it easier. But thank you. Thank you, Pam and Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, panel, um, for the update this morning. I suppose the first one I get to is around the um, SR 2021-96, slash the wearing of face coverings inside a church or other place of worship. I suppose this is a, a recurring issue for me in the sense of why do we not just have a policy where face coverings should be worn inside every building. Um, and I suppose that there's a degree of confusion out there as to where can you, or is there anywhere still left? And should there not just, should you just not move to that position until a time that it's not required? That's my first question. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly this is something that is being considered because, I mean, for the last several months, we haven't had indoor spaces um, open to any large extent. Um, so I think we we have to consider that when we start to open indoor venues. Are we not just there yet? But I think um, you've made a, a valid point that is definitely one that is under discussion um, and, and certainly one that our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor 
uh, are, are very alert to. Um, once you start getting people in, indoors, that's really where the highest risk of transmission is, is, is going to occur. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate if you keep the committee updated on that conversation. The next area is in relation to outdoor exercise. And um, the first change there was the 10 persons from two households. And I think Marianne mentioned there around that would allow people to, to go out in walking groups, or maybe it was yourself, Liz. But um, obviously, one of the groups of people who were pleased to see that outdoor exercise were golfers. And I suppose you, you you are allowing a two ball and in reality it's a four ball usually plays and a lot of people are very upset about that and that's been rectified and then recently there we saw the training in teams and it was only up to 15 people but again that doesn't bear out the reality of how squads operate you know you would have about 16 or 17 at least in a squad plus a coach plus, plus an assistant plus a COVID officer and so I'm just wondering when whatever these regulations are being brought forward these changes amendments how are you actually engaging with the sporting bodies so that whatever things are brought forward, they actually make sense? And I've made this um, point to Naomi, our Justice Minister, around what do you do? Do you put names in a hat of a rugby team and say, actually, okay, we can only have to take the first 13 people, even though there's 17 or 18 in, in a team? You know, how do you engage with the sectoral bodies um, to, to actually make sure that they make sense in practice? Okay, well, well, the lead on the engagement is with the de uh, Department for Communities, and they have been very actively discussing. I would guess they're almost in daily contact from having talked to them. So they are our route into that engagement, and it's very close and, and regular. And none of this is ideal. I mean, I don't think anyone could argue that it is. Um, that's all about compromises. It has been for the past year. Um, I think we were very pleased to be able to get people out and, out and doing some sporting activity um, in groups at all. So, um, yeah, I accept your point about the size of a team and, and uh, so forth. Um, but that's where we were at that time. Um, and more change will come, as, you, as you've already alluded to. Thank you. And just finally, then, in terms of the um, SRs, you know, there, there, there's details there and, and it's welcome, but is there any room to actually put an explanatory memorandum around the public health, um, why a decision has been taken? Because a lot of times we will, as MLAs, we will get feedback from people to say, well, why have they opened that and why have they not opened that? And I suppose it's useful for us then if there is like an explanatory memorandum, as I, as I, as I um outlined there that we can actually point people to to say look you know that the evidence would show from the contact tracing for example that this is a this is a area of, of society where there have been a lot of outbreaks or something i think it's just would be just useful to have it alongside the sr for us to be able to um point people to yeah i i, I understand why you're asking that question I think the, the difficulty is these are executive decisions that are balancing a lot of things. So um, obviously the coronavirus transmission risk is a very important part of that. But there's a, a range of things, as you know, political decision making is complex and juggling a lot of things. So I'm not sure that, that doing that would actually help people that much. There are some general principles, though, and they are reflected in the pathway document as well about, you know, the outdoors. So we've focused on the outdoors. The ones that I've brought to you today are very much around the, the outdoor space. Um, and that's where we've thought um, we, with the scientific advice is that that is the safest place for, to allow people to start to to do things together. So um, you know, so there's general principles apply through this, and you'll see that in the in the changes being made this week as well. Um, so yeah, I t I'll take your point away, but I I'm not sure that that's going to be that easy to do or be that helpful, to be honest. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, and I've gone to Jerry Carroll. And can I just can I just highlight to members? Um, we are losing our broadcasting at one thirty, and ideally, it would be I would I prefer if we could conclude this business with the SRs in that session. So, if members can just keep it as brief as possible, and panel, I'd appreciate your your brevity. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. I'll be quick. Thanks. Uh, I, I kind of share Paula's concerns about the face mask in churches. Um, it seems to be a, a strange oversight, but I, I take um, uh, the point uh, made by Liz uh, that they were closed, but I think there should have been a, 
um, a swifter um, move on that. Um, to just a clarification on the uh, the first SR f- um, fines have been uh, amended. Um, I think, as you said, that was a tidying up exercise or, or words to that effect. But can I just get a bit of clarity on that, please? Yeah, so this is the amendment number six. Um, so let me just, that, that was a, I'll just give you the general, uh, without just being able to put my hand directly on the detail now. What it was, was in an earlier amendment, um, we overlooked, it was, a, it, it was just a drafting issue, we overlooked to make some cross references um, to the fines and penalties uh, in some of the in some of the regulations, so we've just put them back in. That that was just a correction, really. Um, so I think that's the point you've you've asked about, isn't it? It was about the level of fines and uh, fixed penalty notices and how they correlate to specific um, numbered regulations. So yeah, just to to that. yeah, just just a clarity. So so yeah. uh, how do things stand before this SR and how do things stand? with the SR presumably passing in relation to fines uh, is what I'm really trying to yeah. understand. My suggestion on that one is that we actually write to you and tell you what it is because I remember that I've seen a list of all the different cross-references and it just might be a little bit difficult to explain that in, in this format. Um, but could could we come back to you, Jerry, in writing and just explain it to you? Yeah, just just quickly, Chair, because I know we're, we're covered for time, but I mean, it could be a, a simple technical matter, which is fine. Yeah. Is, but, you know, there's been quite a lot of concern about how, who has been issued with fines over this pandemic, you know, particularly people from ethnic minority backgrounds, working class people. Uh, and I would just, I think it's important that we have all the information. It could be, hopefully, just a, it is a tidying up exercise, yeah. but if it's anything more than that, then I think we need to see the detail of, of what we've been asked to support. Thanks. Yeah. No, no, it definitely was a tidying up exercise. It was a an oversight. There was There was no change in policy associated with that. Um, I don't know, Marion, if you've got any other information you can add to that or whether we just uh, clarify for Jerry exactly what the change was. Um, I do have a list here, Liz. Um, as, as you said, it's about the level of fines. So um, it was basically adding in um, a number of, of provision, not adding in, but amending it. Um, they were initially on a lower scale that wasn't and it was tidying it up from that perspective that a number of uh, sectors should have been on a, a higher scale for fines. I think what we'll do, Jerry, is we'll write that for you. I think that's this. Yeah, is this is, I mean, I appreciate the answer and, and, and appreciate that, Marion. But, you know, if there's an increase in scales and obviously that would suggest a, a different policy uh, and that's so I think we need a bit of clarity on that. We'll come back to you on that. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So going then finally to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Liz, for your uh, presentation. Um, firstly, I suppose probably I would agree with Paula's comment in relation to an explanatory note. I think while accepted that would not be possible in every regard, I do think it would help around some of the decisions which will inevitably come based on evidence that is presented to the executive ministers and the health minister. So I would support that call because that does help us uh, explain exactly what is going on. Uh, maybe some of us will agree with that point and some of us will not, but I think it's important. So just to put that on the record. Secondly, Liz, can you define to me what stay local means? Yeah, well, this is something we had um, in guidance around um, staying within a 10 miles, I think, of, of your home, we, it is actually currently being reviewed. So um, you've actually uh, hit on something that we're currently debating um, in terms of what exactly should stay local mean when we make the changes this week. Um, we've, we're opening more things up. Um, what do we mean by stay local if we've got certain venues open that people can travel to? I mean, there is no uh, legal impediment to people moving ac- across Northern Ireland or leaving Northern Ireland, in fact. Um, but we would like quite a strong advisory that people 
really don't take unnecessary risks. I think that's the really major thing. And it, it's perhaps a little bit raw to just talk about it as stay local because it needs to be bound all up with how to behave safely uh, to pre protect yourself and others. And that's, you know, avoiding the crowds as I talked about earlier um, and, and staying outdoors and having good ventilation if you are indoors. So I think it's it's a lot more than that. It's not it's a lot more than stay local, but we have to have some more discussions about what stay local means as we open things up because it isn't really that straightforward to get your head around. Yeah, no, I, I would say that it's it's confusing to say the least mm -hmm. and I suppose disappointing as well that this is a, a another flagship message, which is we're removing the stay at home and we're going to stay local. But nobody has been able to articulate to me what stay local means. So I, I think that that is something that somebody's going to need to get their head around quite quickly mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there's certain... Um, everyone may have a different interpretation yeah. as to what that actually means mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think they need to get their head around that. So I would be interested in you mm -hmm. clarifying that to the committee in as soon as it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, the other point I wanted to say, so SR93, um, is that a full redraft of the regulations and is this intended to make future drafting easier? Um, it, it is basically taking the statute uh, as it was with the number two regulations made in July last year and all the subsequent amendments which amount to 32 different amendments and creating a, a clean uh, set of regulations which can then be amended so it it's really to do with accessibility so we have uh, throughout this period always published consolidated versions every time we amend so that it so that there's one version that shows the regulations as they currently stand so this basically sets that in stone as the platform from which we now make amendments um, but it's more than just a consolidated version because we have I and mean, you'll see the numberings a bit different mm. we've um, tried to, um, to wow. use, we did use expert drafters to help advise us on how to frame things so that they were more easily understood it's not perfect because we're always up against it with the time it's a very complex set of regulations um, so we've even seen things since we made them that we could improve um, but uh, I think uh, certainly I'm finding as somebody working with these regulations all the time that it is very helpful to have done what we did. Okay. Um, I found immediately that I found it easier to work with this set of regulations. Um, okay. so th that was really the, the motivation, and mostly so that the public could, could understand them mm. more clearly. Okay, and, and, and finally, because I know we're pushed for time, but was the requirement for face coverings to be worn in churches only guidance prior to this no. SR? Uh, this wasn't? No. So the requirements to wear face coverings in places of worship or places where beliefs are practiced um, and close contact services um, was in the number two regulations. It was in some of the amendments that were made in the autumn. We were working at pace, at really high pace at that point. So we didn't have time to amend the face coverings regulations at the same time. So we slipped them in for expediency into the number two regulations. They were scrutinized by this committee at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought that it was a good t opportunity to tidy it up and put them in to the face coverings regulations where they should have lived mm -hmm. all along. It was just expedient to put them in the number two regulations. Okay, just so, so long as that is the case, because I, I would be worried if it was mandating this over of other restrictions or moving in the other direction, and nope. here we are moving in a different direction. So that's that's encouraging that you've said that. That's fine. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and thank you then, Liz and Marion, for your attendance today and for dealing with those questions and indeed for the additional information that you've committed to, to send and forward to committee. So I can let you I can we can let you go with that and we'll consider our we we'll take our, our uh, further consideration of each SR now and tomorrow. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and good luck. Okay, members, so I'm going then to each of the SRs in turn, as we normally do. So the first one there is SR 2021 forward slash 71, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Amendment, Number 6, Regs, 
uh, NA 2021. I refer your members to tab seven of your pack. This SR provides for some easements of the restrictions, extends the period of review to the 18th of April, and removes the requirement for the regulations to expire on the 31st of March 2021. It is revoked by SR 2021 93, which is also on today's agenda. The examiner of statutory rules has made her report and has no issues to raise in relation to this SR. Are members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? No. So I can ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered health protection coronavirus restriction number two, amendment number six, regulations 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. SR then 2021 forward slash 81. So SSR provides an exemption for gatherings of up to 10 persons from no more than two households in relation to certain sporting activity. It is revoked by SR 2021 93, which is also on today's agenda. The examiner for statutory rules made her report and has no issue to raise in connection to this SR. Do members have any further issues they wish to raise with that one? No, thank you. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number Two, Amendment Number Seven, Regulations 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to Number Nine, which is SR 2021 forward slash 93. I refer members to put the tab nine of your pack. This SR revokes and replaces the previous. Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Regulations 2020, and provides for the restrictions on business closures and gatherings as outlined in the briefing and in the memo in your packs there. The examiner for Stats Rules has not yet reported on this SR, but has advised that she is seeking further information from the department. In light of that, I propose that the committee defer its consideration of these regulations until the examiner has made her report. Would members be agreed with that line of approach? Yeah, thank you, members. Item 10 is SR 2021 forward slash 86. And I refer members to tab 10 of your pack there. This SR requires face coverings to be worn inside a church or other premises where beliefs are practiced. The examiner of statutory rules has made her report and has no issues to raise in relation to that SR. Do members have any further issues to, to, to raise in relation to it? No, thank you. So can I ask members then to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations 2021 and recommend that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we content? Are we agreed? Yeah, thank you. The final one then, members, is SR 2021 forward slash 87. And I refer you to papers of tab 11 of the pack. These SR provide for some easements of the restrictions, permits click and collect services, removes restrictions on movement, allows 10 people to meet outdoors at a private dwelling, and allows for the reopening of certain businesses. Now, members, the examiner for statutory rules has not yet reported on this SR, but has advised again that she is seeking further information from the department in relation to it. In light of that, I propose that the committee defer its consideration of these regulations until the examiner's report is received. Would members be content? Yeah, great. Thank you, members. Okay, members. So uh, thank you for that. Moving swiftly on to item 12, which is, had been our committee inquiry, COVID-19 and its impact on care homes. I refer members to the letter from the department at tab 12.1 of the pack. The department advised that, the, that it will provide advises that it will provide the committee with a response to its recommendations of the committee's inquiry into the impact of COVID-19 on their homes by 19th of April. However, this has not been received to date. So are members therefore content to note pending consideration of the department's response when it is received? Yeah, thank you, members. Okay, members, moving on to correspondence. Um, I'll just check, uh, Clerk, uh, have we have we now moved out of broadcasting or do we need to pause or can we continue on? Uh, just that um, broadcasting, though, that we'll be shifting the, um, offline. So you'll notice in the next couple of minutes we'll go offline and then um, everyone will come up in the, 
the spotlight so all the staff members will be in there as well so that will happen over the next couple of minutes so we can continue to work away so we can um, and hopefully it will be seamless enough for everybody okay thank you clerk moving on then members to correspondence so can i draw your attention to a number of items there um, item 13.2 is a response from the department to the committee's request for further information on indemnity arrangements including the issue of indemnity for the community and voluntary sector in relation to cyber security any comments members yeah carol go ahead yeah, I mean, I noticed the, a note to correspondence, but actually some of the groups are still having to pay substantial amounts of money to meet the department's uh, criteria. Um, and this is coming from the Department of Health. I've written to the Department for Finance in this as well. So that response for me doesn't actually change with what I've been told on the ground. So I'm just writing further questions, seeking further information on it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, item 13.6 is a request from the Chair of the Regional Workforce Wellbeing Group to present on the work of the Group of Eight. Um, any, uh, any comment from members in relation to that item of correspondence? And would members, uh, would, would members what, what do members think we should, uh, so should we look at that in forward work program in terms of some of the workforce issues that have been touched upon in recent times? Yeah, okay. So we'll, we'll look at that in forward work program. Thank you, members. Um, members, any comments or proposals on any other uh, items of correspondence? Um, can I come Pam, go ahead. Yeah. Pam, uh, Pam first and then Cara. Go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Chair. It's, um, it's actually in the table papers to correspondence. Or you didn't do it. Okay. Sure. Is it okay, well, I'll come to you. I'll come back to you in the table then, Pam. Okay. We're going to it next. Cara, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. No, just to note, I think it's 13.8 there, there from the Rural uh, Community Network, just about regional imbalance. I think it's something really important when we look at the mental health strategy, um, just to be very mindful of the kind of rural barriers that still exist with transport um, and as well as the societal perspective on things like mental health issues. Um, so just Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber.